Boom. Hey folks, how's everyone doing? It If you've been watching the Rust trial, um it is spicy today. Today was a big day. I wasn't expecting that cuz um I guess they really wanted to wake the jurors up on a Monday. <laughs> um yeah. Um So, um yeah, today was Today was exciting. Um, I thought it might be a boring day at the beginning because it was... Um, it started out with a lot of experts. And I thought, okay, experts usually suck. Um, experts just kind of suck. And... Um, I mean, it just is what it is. But um, they didn't stop with experts. They stopped with some of the spiciest exchanges we have seen thus far um so and somebody said is that an edb bug yes i was feeling sorry i'm late i i don't know why it is cold um it seems like it's cold in the house and so i wanted something a little warm to drink so this is actually chicken soup um but yes it's an edb mug and yeah so um all right let us let's have a talk about this one because um the first thing that happens was actually a little bit of spice that um nobody really noticed until the trial was ongoing nobody really noticed until sort of midway through and that is that um like wish.com rob um, is, is gone. And I don't mean gone, gone. I mean, he's just kind of gone because, um, kind it's complicated, I guess. So we'll talk about where, what's happened with wish.com Rob first thing. Uh, and then we'll talk about what happened on Friday because we've got some new insights on, on Friday. So, um, yeah, um, I've also been told I should cover some Super Chats right at the beginning. Uh, we've got Carson Pratt saying, is this stream worth $2 to you? If yes, please Super Chat. Well, thank you, Carson. Uh, Tony P says, uh, it's easily worth $10. Oh, thank you very much. Professor of Logic here is a new member. Uh, the Chugi Show Live has state had an actual armorer testify. Not yet. Uh, still waiting. Dick Schwartz says, good morning. Although we have a guy who's kind of testifying about armors today so that's interesting um this is the first guy that defense has really needed to do something with um and we're people have to have different views on that uh dirk schwartz says good morning from germany with coke light awesome um june b thank you for the five gifted memberships specific kate thank you for five gifted memberships sandy thank you for five gifted memberships um Aaron Olivia, been waiting for this all day. Thank you. John Komen, is cocknotch a symptom of uh, Peyron's disease or projectile dysfunction? EDB referred me to you. <laughs> we can talk about all of that uh, there. Uh, facts not fuckery. That is Emily's slogan. This is this is official EDB merch. Um, somebody sent it to me and I love it. So, And Chase P for pup treats. Aaron Olivia says, I got five on Runkle, and Tyler K has a new membership. Thank you so much. All right. Let us, somebody asked me if I could start these off with, um, with recaps of just what this trial is about. So the Rust trial is about the shooting of Helena Hutchins. Helena Hutchins was the cinematographer on the film Rust, and Rust, uh, the person with the gun in her hand was Alec Baldwin. So Alec Baldwin is going to be on trial later. We've heard July is where he's going to be on trial. But for right now, we're looking at the trial of Hannah Gutierrez, who also goes by Hannah Gutierrez-Reed. And the reason why she goes by Hannah Gutierrez-Reed is to create an affiliation with Thel Reed, who is a famous armor. So why is Hannah on trial? Well, she's on trial because she's the armorer. It is literally her job to make sure no one gets shot on a film set. And obviously that didn't work out because someone got shot. Um, 
And there's all sorts of issues about how did a live round get on set? Um, why didn't she spot it? Why didn't she find it? Um, what's going on? Now, defense is arguing basically that she was too inexperienced and too, um, too uncertain. And yeah, and, uh... Farin says, watching the Rust excerpts today, I'm disappointed it was cancelled. Good news, it wasn't cancelled. At least I don't think so. Um, they went ahead, they finished the movie, so it's probably coming out. So, we will see. Um, but, let us talk about... Uh, yeah, his official trial is July 10th till July 19th. I may see about trying to... Um, trying to make it out there. Um, I might, I'm deciding whether I want to just book time and live stream the trial during the trial days, or if I want to physically go and watch the trial in person. Um, I don't think Mr. Baldwin's going to like me, but, um, no reason not to go. Um, or that's not a good reason not to go. So, uh, let us talk initially about the fireworks that happened behind the scenes with, um, with, uh, what's his name? I forget his name. Uh, Bullion. Bullion, or Bullion, or, yeah. So, we're going to pull this up right now. Because people noticed he didn't do anything today. Well, he didn't do anything today because... He wanted to get off record. He he wanted to get off record. Um, so, this is a minute order that we got. They went and made these arguments orally, right? They just made a verbal motion. They didn't file anything about this. And the reason why they didn't file anything about this is because I'm guessing this happened last night, that there was an argument, there was a fight. Um, I'm pretty sure... Now, I'm theorizing, I think there was a fight. I think there was a, I think there was a, you know, a thing. I guess uh, somebody in the chat has pointed out there's a bit of irony. I'm drinking a bit of uh, bouillon myself. All right. So, I'm guessing that the fight was between bouillon and Hannah Gutierrez Reed. Let's see why I think that. I mean, it's not just for nothing. So, ruling. Defendant's motion for withdrawal of counsel, Mr. Todd J. Bullion, is denied. What does that mean? He wanted, um, he wanted or she wanted Mr. Bullion to be off the file. Um, so that is interesting, right? Because, you know, it's like, whose application is this? But this also goes to an important thing about what sucks about being a lawyer, which is that once you go on record on a file, there is no guarantee that you can get off record, that you can suddenly stop being the lawyer for a particular person. You have to ask for permission. And the court can say no. And in this case, the court has said no. The court has said, no, you are not permitted to leave the trial at this stage. So Mr. Bullion shall remain co-counsel of record, attend trial, and continue to sit at counsel's table. So, um, I'm just going to note, at the point where he's making the application to get off record, he is probably not necessarily, like, I don't know if he's still getting paid for this, right? Hopefully, hopefully, he has, hopefully he's got all of his money ahead of time. But let's assume he doesn't. Let's assume that he doesn't have money for this. Or let's assume that there was some way of, um, you know, taking the money back. Well, um, he would have to do work for no money. It is entirely possible that lawyers have to basically... Um, I don't want to use the word slavery because it's not a good word. But it's forced work for no money. And I've seen lawyers have to do this. I have actually had to be in this position where you say, hey, the client hasn't paid me. And the judge says, tough, you have to still work and you have to still do it. So you are at that point, um, 
At that point, you are forced to work under threat of jail or other punishments. Like, they can actually throw you in jail for refusing. Um, for no money. And it sucks. Um, so, but this is where things get really interesting, is this next little line here. However, to avoid potential disruptions at trial, Mr. Bullion shall refrain from directly communicating with defendant Gutierrez as requested by defendant. Um, so, Ms. Gutierrez doesn't want Mr. Bullion talking to her. And somebody says, is he the attorney with the beard? Heavy set man. Yep. Yep. Um, He's been kicked off. He's not even allowed to talk to her. They got in some kind of fight. Uh, that's what I'm seeing from this, right? And that is... That's messy. There is some kind of drama here that we're never going to find out. We're never going to find out what the deal is on this one. But um, So he's going to be there in the courtroom the whole time from now until the end of the trial but he's not gonna he's he's kind of sidelined defendant's motion to allow entry of new co-counsel ms monica l barreras is granted ms barreras may enter her appearance in the case and participate in trial this if you were watching the trial today you will have seen a new woman who's appeared like and people were going, where's she? Where, like, where's she been? Well, she's just come on the file. She is literally a new lawyer there. It is not the Tiara Queen. It's somebody else. Somebody was saying, is it the Tiara Queen? No, it seems to be some new, um, new lawyer. Um, and so she's now on the file. She actually does some cross-examination today. And that's interesting. Now, they also note, Ms. Lead Attorney Mr. Jason Bowles shall direct and coordinate co-counsel Mr. Bullions and co-counsel Ms. Barrera's respective participation in the trial, if any. Bowles has the, has the keys. He's got the whip. He can say, um, you know, Ms. Barrera, you're up. Uh, he can say, uh, Mr. Bullion, you're up. So Mr. Bullion may still end up doing something. Like he, it may still be like, you prep to cross this witness, you're going to cross them. So um, this is really interesting. Really interesting as to what's going on. Um, is Bullion the one who asked out loud for the phone numbers to be read? That was the prosecutor. So um, I, I don't know what's going on, but uh, that was the order we saw. So that's our first piece of pigeon business going on. Um, the next piece of pigeon business that's happening is... Um, what happened last time? So, Friday, uh, we had some stuff that went down. And it was some, some business. So let us, let me try to find this. This is actually from Recovery Addicts channel. So guys, um, just going to pause it as soon as it comes up here. Um, this was found by Recovery Addict. I got to give him the credit for this. So check out his stream, check out his discussion. Um, and it might be that Bullion dropped the ball in making sure the phone numbers were not redacted properly. That might be the source of the, the fight there. Um, so recovery addict, he's got great coverage. He's got great sort of stuff. Um, and he caught this. So before I was wondering like what happened with that whole court TV business. And when I was talking to Rob, I was saying like, if you watch Friday night frenzy, it was after my stream. I said, wait a minute. When we rewatch this, the whole th discussion of court TV last Friday, I said, they don't seem to be chewing out court TV. They actually seem to be chewing out the lawyers and the gallery for something, right? They seem to be chewing out the lawyers and the gallery for, and saying like, court TV can't be on. So here is from Recovery Addicts stream talking about, um, you know, talking about a critical moment. Oh, 
He's playing. He's playing the YouTube stream. Hi, you were you watching, were watching the, video the video to watch, to watch chat, chat to see what, to see what public, public is thinking, is thinking about, about the comments and what's being presented, what's presented. And you had and that, you going, had that going, in the... going in the... Oh, sorry, folks. You guys are getting an echo. I can... That's because of how I've got to get my audio going in order to make work properly with the other video. We're going to try this again. It's not the best audio in the first place. He's playing the YouTube stream. The replay of his previous testimony. You were watching the video to watch chat to see what public is thinking about the comments and what what's being presented. And you had that going in the background and we heard both audios. Okay, so what happened there is the computer that was used to play the video was also playing the live stream. And so when the video stopped and the, and the testimony started, we heard the, uh, the delayed audio from the live stream. Okay, so uh, Recovery Addict caught that. I did not catch it at the time. Um, but yeah, what seems to have happened is that what we saw in the Maya trial, uh, Rob actually spoke to the lawyers and was able to get confirmation that the the lawyers in the taking care of Maya trial were watching, you know, some of the coverage. They were watching Rob's coverage. They were watching other coverage. And so because they could see like the discussions of it, they could see the legal commentary and they were finding that to be useful. So the lawyer on the left here, who is with the prosecution, seems to have been watching, uh, seems to have been watching the, you know, the trial on his, um, uh, on, on his laptop and that got played. And that was a real problem. Now people are saying, is that bullion? No, bullion is the guy on the right, uh, here with the, you know, the, uh, the big beard and the mustache. So that, it really explains why the judge was so upset, um, is because how did they get caught watching this and so forth? Um, I sent this, you know, EDB mentioned this on her stream. I sent her the details on what was going on, but, um, you know, and EDB's comment was like, why aren't they watching me? They should be watching me. And you know what? They should be because Emily's got good coverage of this. And, you know, she's got a much bigger chat than Court TV does. Also, Court TV's chat is like, mm, sometimes. So, uh, but that said, it makes sense to keep keep tabs on it. Just maybe be very, very careful that you don't accidentally play it for the jury and so forth. And somebody says, bullion is wish Rob. Yes, bullion is wish.com Rob. So, um, whoop. yeah. Uh, so that explains why the judge was so pissed, right? Now we have our solution to this problem. Um, Yay. <laughs> Yay. Um, all right. So let's pull that down. And um, we got some stuffs going on. We got some things going on. And um, yeah, uh, let's talk about, let's talk about the stuff that, um, let's talk about the stuff that happened today that is I thought would be the big stuff. And then later I was like, nope, 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 no. I was wrong about that. Um, so I got to take this down and pull up this and maximize. All right. So we're going to pull up. This is a guy by the name of Ziegler. And I got to fix my audio so that you guys will be able to hear this again. Um, 
I got to juggle a whole bunch of things, right? When I'm showing things, when I'm, yeah, it's, it's a whole process. I'm still figuring it out. Um, so here we got this guy. Um, here he is on Court TV. This is Ziegler. He is a firearm forensic guy. And that is what he does. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about him, but I've got some critical thoughts about firearm forensics in general. He gets called to testify to a bunch of stuff that I don't know that he was really necessary for. Be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, have a seat talking to the microphone. Ziegler is, is indeed Mr. Fullcock. Mr. Zig... Oh. Is your microphone on? Yes. Okay. Mr. Ziegler, uh, go ahead and just state your full name for the record. My name is Bryce Ziegler. First name spelled B-R-Y-C-E. Last name spelled Z-I-E-G-L-E-R. Mr. Ziegler, how are you currently employed? I'm currently employed by the Federal Bureau of Investigation within the laboratory division, specifically within the firearms and tool marks unit. Okay, so he's going to be our guy doing the gun analysis. And there's a bunch of things he's here to testify to. Um, and Manders, I see your question. We're going to get to that because that is a big thing that he's here for. So um, he is an expert in firearm and tool mark analysis. We can see him sort of get to that. Um, expertise. Have you been right away here. as an expert in that apply to this case? Sure. The, I would say those two areas are the examination of firearms and also firearms He was supposed to break the gun. Okay. I'll tell you why. Um, we will ask He was supposed to, to break the gun. Well, you know what, let, let, let me pause. Um, have, you, have you testified before? Yes, I have. A and have you been qualified as an expert in other courts? Yes, I have. Um, and how many other courts have qualified you as an expert? Yes. 13. And are those all federal courts or state courts? 10 of those are federal, three were state. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would ask the court to recognize uh, Mr. Ziegler as an expert in firearms examination and firearms identification. Thank you, identification. All right, you are recognized as an expert in examination of firearms and firearm identification. All right, people are asking who this guy is, the big guy in the back. That is their tech guy. Um, this prosecutor doesn't seem to be good with tech stuff so um he's always there whenever she's doing tech stuff i think he's he looks kind of i mean he ends up looking kind of creepy because he's this great big looming dude <laughs> it's uh it's kind of weird so they talk about the gun we'll pull that up here Mr. Ziegler, tell us a little bit about this firearm that was provided to you. What kind of a gun is it? And just generally speaking, how does a gun like this operate? So this is an image, a photograph of the revolver that was submitted. And this is a single action revolver. So that means that the hammer must be manually cocked by the shooter every time that the shooter intends to fire. So some revolvers, if you pull the trigger, it will do the work of cocking the hammer for you and releasing the hammer. This type of firearm does not have that ability. The shooter must physically cock the hammer each time. Um, is this a touch screen by chance? So to point out a few key... So um, if you were watching Emily's chat, you saw her being an absolute 13-year-old in the funniest ways possible about how many times this guy says cocked because he's going to say cocked a lot. Um, we don't have a counter for it. The thing is, is that it is the appropriate word, right? It is the appropriate word for this. But so he is explaining what is, um, you know, what's going on here about how this gun works. So this is actually useful stuff. Areas of this firearm. The I'm not faulting EDP. I thought it was hilarious. I was in her chat laughing. He's going to come help you. Okay. 
Thank you. So the portion on the left in this photograph is the barrel. Towards the center, we have the cylinder. This back portion here is the hammer. We have the trigger near the bottom. And this wooden piece is the grip. So this is where you would hold the firearm. Figure this out. So if you thought that you should hold the gun by, say, the middle, this guy's real helpful. Um, real helpful if you didn't know that. So um, he's going to talk a little bit about how it gets loaded. And I'm just going to say one of the things about how to load the gun is a way that nobody ever actually loads the gun. So let's hear that. So basically, in order to get this firearm to function, you would have to load cartridges into the cylinder. This can be accomplished two ways. You can't see it in this photograph, but on the opposite side is what's called a loading gate. You can open, and you then have access to the cylinder. So you can load each cartridge one at a time, rotating the cylinder until you have as many cartridges as you desire. You could also remove this pin here, remove the cylinder from the firearm, and load it that way. But regardless... Nobody actually loads the gun by unpinning the cylinder and then, like, no, that is not how you do this. I mean, theoretically, I guess. Um, theoretically, maybe, but um, no, <laughs> no. Um, all right, so... Uh, yeah. Uh, this guy had some really interesting discussion about, like, you know, later on about, uh, well, we can get to that. I hope I've got the right timestamp for it, because uh, my timestamps are still a little wonky. I'm still trying to figure all this out. Um, so, let us get to, um, at about, I think it's about here. Just a picture of what was going on inside these cartridges. So again, I took those two pieces of information, sorted them into groups, and then eventually I worked with the contributor to determine which um, of these cartridges... Are cold handguns ambidextrous? I think so. I don't think so there's any... Uh, the bullet, I mean, aside from the loading see, gate. Is there any powder present? Does it look like the primer is active or not? So those were kind of the three phases to sort of determine which categories these cartridges actually fell into. Okay, and quickly, I'm going to jump you to the accidental discharge testing that you did. Uh, can you summarize for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what that accidental discharge testing consisted of and why you did that testing? So we got a question here about, could you carry several spare loaded cylinders and swap them over in a long shootout? It would have to be a very long shootout because that process of dismantling the gun to remove the cylinder and put in a new cylinder is actually a fairly um is actually a fairly slow and you know you're actually taking stuff apart right and so um you'd have to actually like unscrew bits and so forth um and edward wright says i guess i'm a nobody because i've loaded it that way fair enough i mean it's it's a pain, right? Um, normally, if you want to reload fast, this is not the gun for you. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Nin Kibbles is saying, have I ever bashed a gun with a mallet before? I have not, but I'm going to talk about that. Um, swapping cylinders. There are guns that are made for swapping cylinders where that was sort of a thing. This is not one of them. So this one is not really designed for that process. Right, so again, uh, accidental discharge, its goal is essentially to determine, can I fire this firearm without pulling the trigger? That's, that's kind of the end goal. We'll talk about that and when we get the to that. we do that is the test is designed to simulate the firearm being bumped or banged into something, just being jostled around, um, and seeing can those kind of interactions fire the firearm. So the way we replicate this in the laboratory is I will take the gun and actually strike it with a rawhide mallet on six planes. So if you picture, picture a box sitting in front of you, the six planes would be the front of the box, the rear of the box, the left side, the right side, the top, and the bottom. 
So those are the six planes. So if you kind of picture the revolver and picture how those six planes work around that gun, I'm going to go around and strike the firearm in all six of those planes with a rawhide mallet. Again, trying to determine if it will actually fire without me touching the trigger. So this really... Lots of people had opinions about this because you, they're sitting there going, wait a minute, this, this, the forensic scientific testing is literally this guy gets a, a, a hammer and hits the thing. Now, I mean, it's a rawhide mallet, and do you know where else you use a rawhide mallet? Um, Leatherworking, believe it or not. Um, Leatherworking is another place you use a, um, you know, is another place you use a rawhide mallet. And part of the reason why you'd use a rawhide mallet instead of like a metal hammer is that the rawhide actually absorbs some of the impact. And so when you're doing leather work, you've got your brass, you know, you've got your tool and you're hitting it with the mallet, right? And if it's a, if it's a metal hammer, then you're going to be like creating a very sharp impact on this thing. And, um... At that point, you're going to you're going to potentially break this. So the rawhide mallet is less likely to leave dents. It's less likely to shatter the material. It's less likely to any of those things. So that's why they're using the rawhide thing is that it's less likely to to cause breakage. But the you know the next thing is that people say, wait a minute, this guy actually breaks the gun. And he does. Um, we'll we'll talk about that a little bit. And specifically, when you're striking the firearm, are you striking the hammer? That was a part of the testing that I did, yes. Prior to conducting that testing, um, did you have any thoughts about and I'm gonna take whether that to one could and a half. potentially result in damage to the gun? Right, so this is actually in our standard operating procedures that this type of testing is potentially destructive to the firearm. Um, so just kind of generally speaking, if I'm going to do an exam that may destroy or alter the evidence permanently, I would seek out the contributor's permission to do that exam before I actually go and do it. So that, that is what was done in this case. So this is important because a whole lot of people are saying, like, why did he break the gun? And the thing is, is that this kind of, this test often destroys the gun. And... What I will see, like I've seen this in lots of different testing, is we wanted to see if we could get this to fire by, you know, you know, through other means. And they often test to failure. This is a very common thing that they do. <laughs> Once again, I managed to pause with his tongue out. So um, my pause game continues to be on point. The problem is, is that once you've broken the evidence, what does a defense lawyer say? Well, they broke the evidence. I can't test it now, right? So this is so common, right? This this is really common that you'll have this, this interaction of like, how did you test it? Well, I hit it with a hammer until it broke. Why did you do that? Um, this is super, super common. Lots of people were real upset by this, and yeah. Um, let us take us to uh, 59 minutes, I think. Uh, doing my striking in the six planes as I described, and eventually I got to the rear. I don't disagree arm, so with that, this. That back plane, and eventually at some point I struck the hammer with a rawhide mallet, and the hammer actually fell, and it detonated the primer. So what happened was some of the internal components of the firearm actually broke to allow that hammer to fall and fire the, the prime cartridge case. So I previously mentioned those quarter and half cock notches. If the hammer were to fall and there was no damage inside the gun, I would expect that the, the, the portion that makes contact with the hammer is called the sear. That sear should have been caught either by the quarter or the half cock notch as the hammer was falling. It should not have been able to fall all the way. So this is what led me to believe that there was some type of damage that occurred within the gun. And eventually I disassembled it to figure out exactly what that damage was. So basically, this is a, uh, a situation where um, there's basically two ways this gun can go off by accident. Um, one is 
uh, if you hit it with the when the hammer is all the way down. But if you pull it back to the like, you know, the the quarter cock, the half cock, or the full cock stops. I know people are going to be commenting, but oh well. Um, then it's not supposed to go off. The thing is, is that there's actually little sort of hooks, little bits that catch the sear at, and keep it from turning. And they hit it with the hammer enough that it caused those parts to break. And once those parts broke, now you've got a gun that is just dangerous, right? He broke the gun to the point where it was dangerous and would no longer work, you know, in that sense. Now, this is what I would expect them to do, right? To to do that. So, um, yeah. Um, now, they get into some stuff that I thought was completely freaking unnecessary. Um, it's completely unnecessary in this trial. And here is where we have this. Um, States Exhibit 99. Explain to us what we're looking at here. So these are just additional images of the same fired bullet. So I took these using my microscope, so they're uh, a little bit higher magnification. Um, and basically, in both of these photos, the bullet is pointing to the left. So you're looking at uh, the image on the left, you're looking at all the damage and abrasions that were present on that bullet when I received it. And the image on the right is similar to the one you saw on the previous slide, where it, it doesn't have the deep gouges in different directions, but the rifling is still virtually gone from this bullet. Can you tell us what caliber this bullet is? When we receive fired bullets, uh, the only way we can estimate the caliber is based on the diameter, so I can measure the diameter of the bullet, and also the bullet weight. So for those two items, they were very close between a 44 caliber and a 45 caliber bullet. So I classified it as either a 44 or 45 caliber bullet. Can you explain to us um, why a 45 caliber bullet, by the time it gets to you, may have a different uh, diameter and weight? Sure, so this projectile is lead, which is a relatively soft material. Most modern bullets are going to have a harder jacketing material, so it's going to have a lead core with a harder jacket around it. The most common type is going to be copper, and that harder material is going to protect the lead core. It's going to help it keep its mass as it starts hitting things. But because this is lead, it's relatively soft, it's, very, it's much more susceptible to damage when it hits things. So it's possible that when I receive a bullet or even a bullet fragment, and I go to take a measurement of that bullet, it may be less than the true measurement because it's hit things, and I now only have a partial bullet. Or conversely, it, it could actually be a wider diameter because it hits something and it flattens, so that causes it to expand. So, so basically, the damage to this bullet is because it hit so not something, it hits someone. Um, and it isn't, this isn't an old bullet. It's an old style of bullet. Most 45 Long Colt bullets are soft lead, or at least a lot of them are. I've got a whole bucket of them in the other room. I'm not going to go get it because I'm on a live stream and YouTube's got things. They don't like you handling firearms or ammunition or whatever on a live stream. So that limits me. But I've got a whole bucket of them in the other room, and they're all like big blocks of lead. So, um, but, you know, one of the things that happens is some of that bullet might have actually been left in Hannah Gutierrez Reed, um, or sorry, in Helena Hutchins. Some of it may have been left in Joel Souza. Um, it just is what it is um so yeah the uh what is it is a bucket proper ammo storage in canada i mean the bucket's in a safe so yes um also my bucket of ammo is a bucket that is just one kind of ammo and not like a mixed pile like we saw on you know in this trial um so then they're gonna break out like you know, they're going to talk about all sorts of other stupid things here. Um, and I say stupid things because there's no reason to talk about this so in this trial. Is one specific caliber. And States Exhibit 100, what's this? These are two images of the fired cartridge case that was submitted for the examination. So the left image is uh, from the side, and the right image you're looking at what's called the head stamp of the cartridge. So the head stamp itself is the outer ring where you're going to see information such as the caliber, so 45 Colt is the caliber. Uh, you may also see symbols which relate to the manufacturer. And then this silver colored surface in the center here is the primer that I've been talking about. So this is what the firing pin comes into contact with when you pull the trigger. 
So this crater in the center, that's the firing pin impression. So when the firing pin uh, falls, strikes the primer, it leaves behind an impression of the firing pin. And also during the firing pin, uh, excuse me, the firing process, the cartridge case rests up against a flat surface called the breech face. And during the firing process, this cartridge case slams into the breech face and it can pick up an impression of imperfections on that surface. So you may see some parallel lines. Some of these lines are kind of arcing. They almost appear to be crosshatch. Again, there's more parallel lines on the left here. Oh, I see some people saying, can I turn the court volume up? I think I can now. Let me just do that. Um, we're going to crank him right up, crank the court right up. Um, so, hey, Recovery Addict, I was giving you credit for uh, having spotted the uh, the issue for Friday. So, well done on that. Um, the other thing I'm just going to note here is that... Um, so, what he's talking about, we'll just embiggen. Um, he's talking about all of these, like, you know, in like these markings that are left behind by the fire... This is the kind of evidence that would be really useful if it was relevant, you know, if there was some question about whether this bullet was fired from that gun. But nobody disputes this. Why didn't they just stipulate to this and agree to this and skip all of this? I suspect that they did, in fact, agree to all of this and that the whole reason this is in here is just to make this guy look like some sort of better expert because really what he's here to testify to is this is why the gun is broke. Like, that's really, yeah. That's an impression that this cartridge case has picked up from the breech face of the firearm. Did you compare this casing with anything else, any other casings? Um, this was the only fired cartridge case that was submitted, but I did compare it to those known specimens that I collected from the revolver that was submitted. And the known specimens, are those the ones that you fired out of the revolver yourself? That's correct. That's the secondary evidence that I spoke about earlier. So I create again. We nobody like this is silly that this is actually, you know, a thing at this trial. Maybe maybe Hannah's team was unwilling to stipulate to this, but um, I mean, this is something you testify. This is testimony you have to avoid the issue of like. Did somebody lean in through a window and shoot Helena Hutchins, you know, at the same time that this was happening? No, no one did that. So, hmm, that, that, that's unnecessary. We don't need this. Um, and it makes me angry and annoyed. So, um, yeah. And are they different than the live rounds, the five live rounds that we've seen photos of previously? There are some. Whoop, we're going to skip back a little bit here. Based My time stamping was not ideal. Shape, projectile, or bullet as the other four. All right, we're skipping back a little further. We have the cartridges that were in this box, they were we dummy cartridges. And some of them had visual indicators. As I mentioned before, they may have a hole drilled in the side, or you could shake them. And again, that's an audible indicator. However, there was one cartridge in this box that, again, had the four components required to be live ammunition. And when you're looking at this photo, can you identify the cartridge that you believe was determined to be live? I believe it was this one here with the silver primer. Thank you. And somebody's saying, why... States Exhibit 104. What's this? Somebody was saying, why am I making you guys watch this if it's irrelevant? Because lots of you will have watched this, and if you have watched this and you went... Wait, why was he telling us all this? I'm I'm telling you why they why they're bringing it up. This is actually two additional images of that cartridge that I just uh, pointed out on the screen. Live cartridge. So this is a side view of the cartridge on the left and an image of the head stamp region on the right. I want to talk the to you about the characteristics the of this brand. cartridge compared to the four live cartridges that we saw earlier. Does this cartridge have the same shape or sorry, projectile this might or be bullet the dummy. as the other four? Yes, it does. Or, yeah. Does it have Sorry, the same indication the on the head stamp? Yes. And does it have the same color primer? It does. States I jumped in on the, uh, the middle here. Can you tell here. us what we're looking at here? These are images of additional ammunition that was submitted uh, for examination. And these, uh, some of the ammunition came in being declared as live ammunition. So these are images of some of those cartridges that were submitted. So these are all live? 
they were described as being live and they had the physical characteristics of being live. So Based these on are the information that you received that went along with these. Why are they getting into these live versus other live and so forth? Because these are the live ones found at the set with that rounded projectile, the rounded bullet versus the live ammunition found at PDQ, the live ammunition that was found at Seth Kenny's place, because the defense is going to say that it came from Seth Kenny, right? And so what they're pointing out here is the difference in bullet shape, the, uh, you know, because the Seth Kenny ammunition is semi wad cutter. Um, cartridges. Where did, where did these cartridges come from? May I refer? Go ahead. These cartridges are described as having been, or excuse me, as having come from Seth Kenny. And do these cartridges, are they different than the live rounds, the five live rounds that we've seen photos of previously? There are some differences, yes. What are those? So I see differences in the morphology of the bullet, so the shape of the bullet. Uh, for instance, this first one in the top left, this is actually a nickel-plated hollow-point bullet, so it's not the lead flat nose that you previously saw. Uh, the images below that, these bullet types, are semi wad cutters. So again, it's just a different design of bullets, so it's, it's different in shape than the ones you previously saw. You also see additional head stamps here, such as Winchester, GFL, which is a trade name called Fioki, and as well as CBC, which is made by Magtech. Um, and this, due to the glare, it's a little difficult to see in this photo, but I also believe there's differences in the colors of the primers. And uh, let me ask you, if you were to go to a gun store and buy a box of ammunition, would the ammunition in that box have different shaped projectiles? No, if I was buying a you get one shape box, in a box of ammunition, you go to Walmart, it's going to say on the outside what those bullet designs are. For example, it may say uh, jacketed hollow point, it may say round nose, it may say truncated cone. So I would expect if I open that brand new box of ammunition, all of the bullet morphologies would be the same. Thank you. States Exhibit 106. What's this? All right. So this is really what they're trying to you know cover here. Now, is there ever a time when a live round should be anywhere near a movie set? For a fictional movie like this, uh, the answer is no. Uh, the answer is a hard, hard no. The only time when it should be... Um, the only time when there should be a live cartridge potentially is that... Um, uh, if you're doing something like a Mythbusters show and what that is, is like if you're filming like a slow motion shot of a projectile hitting like a watermelon or whatever else, or like a ballistic dummy, and you're doing that in order to show the bullet impact. Um, and that's only if you're doing something again, like a Mythbusters, a documentary about ballistics, those kinds of things. And there you would not have that would be a very different thing. You wouldn't mix that up with like people pointing guns at each other. That would not happen at the same set. Um, and the controls on that are very, very strict. For something like the filming of Rust, there should never be a live projectile on set. Um, bullet impacts are not, in a movie, are not done by shooting a bullet at something. They're done by, I point the gun, and a squib goes off. That's not that's not done by firing a projectile. It's done by pyrotechnics. And, I mean, I've got a pyrotechnics card. I can actually do those squibs. That's something I can, you know, I can do. And this is a good point, except that PDQ has gotten a month after the shooting, so it's not really that much of a win. He might have thrown out all of his ammo and replaced it. Um, they're going to be pointing the finger at, you know, at Seth Kenny there. Um, for what it's worth, the movie Act of Valor had one bit filmed on a live, uh, military live fire range. Oof. Yeah, I mean, mm. it should, like, there's no, there's no reason why there should have been live ammunition here at all. Full stop. So, all right. Um. So, uh, let's see what else that we had that, um, let's go to his cross. Well, 
Uh, let's go to his cross-examination here because um, I don't want to spend too much time on this guy. He's going to have lots to say, but um, let's go to his cross um, because we can see what the defense was trying to do with this guy. Biggest question is, how did the bullet get there? It's kind oh, sorry, of a red herring. Writing. That was out of the frame. Uh, so I'm going to scroll up here. Is this an exhibit that we've already looked at? Yes. Uh, item 13-1, did that come from the set of the movie Rust? Excuse me. I'm sorry. 13-1, did that come from the box that was provided to you? Yes. The box of ammunition uh, that we saw earlier? Yes, this was the box where the majority of the cartridges were in fact dummy cartridges, but this was the one that had the characteristics of being live. And just comparing the ammunition on the left and the ammunition on the right, can you see distinguishing characteristics, understanding that you cannot see the head stamp or the primer? Yes, so the, as we previously discussed, the bullets are a different shape. And I'm going to show you States Exhibit 2, or I'm sorry, 102 on the left, and those are items 4 through 7. Uh, where did items 4 through 7 come from in terms of the description you received? Those were the ones that I previously mentioned were from the top of a cart, and with item 7 being found in a holster inside a building. Do these cartridges that we're looking at on the left and the right, uh, do they appear to be, do they appear to have the same shape projectile? Yes, they do. All right, thank you. I'll pass the witness. So that was that, you know, of trying to, um, you know, trying to do that one there. But um, so now they're going to go and defense is going to come in with some uh, some interesting questions. Sir, good morning. Good morning. Well, Mr. Ziegler, I want to start with your, your training with the FBI. Uh, as part of that training, were you trained in, in recognizing dummy rounds? Uh, there were many portions of the training manual dedicated to ammunition, uh, ammunition components. I can't recall if there is a specific task uh, related to dummy ammunition. And, and by answering that way, it sounds to me like you were not trained on the recognition and characteristics of various types of dummy rounds, correct? I don't necessarily agree with that. Well, do you remember any modules that you were trained on dummy rounds or, or, or not? Not specific, no. Okay. So you wouldn't know what a Denix round is, would you? I do not. Okay. And Why are they not trained on dummy rounds? Well, because dummy rounds are not usually the kind of thing that comes up in the stuff the FBI does. Um, the FBI doesn't typically deal with that because it's a weird problem. Um, really, the only time you're going to find a dummy round is either some sort of strange, strange murder scene or, um, or a movie set. So, um, that's kind of, oh, and hey, legal vices I see in the house. So awesome. Um, now I'm going to pour myself a little bit of scotch. Well, not, I'm going to pour myself a little bit of technically scotch. It's Johnny Walker, but, um, so he's basically saying you, he's going to say you needed a whole bunch of experience to figure this out. You wouldn't know a Denix round is from Spain and it doesn't shake and it's a dummy round you're not aware of that? I'm not familiar with that. Okay. Now, also with respect to your training, you were trained in gun safety, correct? Yes, sir. And, and as an FBI agent, you're trained in gun safety, including don't point a, a weapon at anybody? I'm not an agent, but because I fire as part of my job, I have been trained in safety precautions, yes. Okay, sir, and as part of your test firing protocols, I'm sure you observe all those, those safety. Uh, not to point a gun at anybody, treat it as loaded, keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to fire, you observe all those? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, I will say, if this guy was an agent, he would have been trained to fire at people. Um, that is one thing that FBI agents might actually have to do, is shoot people sometimes. Um, yeah. And sir, um, you indicated one of your opinions was that your first testing, you determined this gun functioned normally. That's correct. Okay. When you were doing that functionality test on the revolver you received, what types of things did you look at on the firearm? So first I would inspect things like are there bulges in the barrel, cracks in the frame, things things that I may think lead to may lead to a catastrophic failure during the testing. Okay, sir, do you take that revolver apart in the initial stage? I do not. So later on, and I'll come back to this, but you indicated when you hit that hammer with your mallet, 
that it fractured some internal components, correct? Correct. And there was um, the sear, we saw uh, a little piece of the trigger, you remember, sir? Yes. Now, because you did not open the revolver uh, prior to doing the, that hammer test, uh, can you be certain those weren't, any of those pieces weren't broken before? I would say I can't be 100% certain. However, because it did function normally, I would expect those pieces were intact at the time I received it and did that initial examination. Okay. This was not a great question or not a great answer from this guy. And he says, I would expect. Um, they didn't take it apart. What he sh It isn't so much I would expect. It's that... Um, it's that it couldn't have functioned normally if those components were broken in the way that we found them broken when they opened it up, right? Because they would have... Somebody with maybe, I don't know, better skill at answering questions uh, would have said, like, no, it couldn't have functioned the way it functioned had it been broken like that ahead of time. But, you know, he didn't answer it all that well. Um, and somebody said, uh, have you watched any of the police interviews on Crime Circus? I've watched all of them. How did they get those interviews? Freedom of Information Act? Yes, Freedom of Information uh, requests. So. And when you um, visually examined it from the outside, you then test fired that weapon 12 times. Is that right? As it was 12 times throughout the process, but yes. And you observed uh, when you did that that it had to be fully cocked and that that trigger had to be depressed to fire it, correct? Aside from the hammer being at rest and being struck on a loaded chamber. I've never tried it. Correct. And other than those tests you did, I'm talking about the first part, uh, it fired normally. Correct. Okay. Um, now, after you did that normal gun functionality testing, you determine its functioning, you then do what's called accidental discharge testing. Is that right? That was after the microscopic comparisons were done, so that was the last test that I did. Okay. So you, you do the functionality, then you do the microscopic examination we saw, and then you do the accidental discharge. Correct. Okay. Now, the accidental discharge, you mentioned that you um, consulted the FBI SOP. That's correct. Now, an SOP is a standard operating procedure? Yes, sir. Now, under that standard uh, some operating Some of them. I don't think I have all of them. Were you to do a, a type of test called a drop test? So the drop test is, I would say that's a subcategory of accidental discharge, where I physically drop the firearm to see if it will fire. And that is typically only done if that is as the situation has been reported by the contributor. So that was not uh, relevant in this case. Oh. Okay, so what is, why do they do a drop test? Well, some guns are not what you would call drop safe. Um, a drop safe gun is a gun that, um, you know, that has some mechanism in it that prevents it from firing without pulling the trigger. There are some, there are various ways this can happen. One of the most common ways is that the firing pin um, doesn't directly impact. It's got to have some sort of transfer bar or the like, or that there's something that physically locks in the uh, the firing pin when it's not being pulled. So, and then the way that is, the way it tells that you're actually trying to shoot the gun is a variety of different ways. Some of them have a grip safety, where the safety is that you grab the gun and that actually it will enable it to fire because you're grabbing it. Some of them have um, trigger safeties where it's only when the trigger is pulled does that happen. So the reason why these six shooters, like these six round guns, often were only load, loaded to five is because they weren't super drop safe. But he's saying, I didn't really do a lot, like I wasn't super concerned about the drop safety because nobody said the that Baldwin dropped it, right? Had Baldwin said, I dropped the gun and it went off, that is um, that is a different thing. And Rachel K says, so there wasn't a safety. No, not every gun's got a safety to it. Some guns have several safeties. Um, they may have like a safety switch. Um, that's what most people think of when they think of a safety. But they can have other safeties, you know, safeties for drop safeties, safeties for all sorts of things, right? There's all sorts of possible, um, some guns have a mag safety, where if you take the magazine out, that it can't fire, um, or at least it's not supposed to fire, never really rely on a safety. But some guns have a mag safety where if you pull the mag out, that it's not supposed to fire, even if there's one in the chamber of the gun. Um, so... You know, that, and there's different advantages and disadvantages to that. 
Okay, when you say, uh, and a drop test, you can tell the jury more, that's when you, from a distance of about four feet, uh, drop the weapon, and if it lands and it's, it fires, that's what you're trying to determine, correct? It depends on how the situation is being reported. So within that same SOP, it, it provides the examiner some discretion as uh, in regards to how that is believed to occur. So for instance, say I'm cleaning my gun and I accidentally knock it off the table and I'm saying that caused it to fire. I would try to replicate that situation. If I had a gun leaning against a door and I'm saying that the door opened and the firearm fell, I would try to replicate that situation. So yes, the traditional drop test is just it being held as you would to shoot it and dropping it, but there is some discretion that's allowed if it is being reported in a certain way. So he's basically saying for the purpose of forensic testing, you try to make it sound the same way the accident happened, right? So it might be that you drop it from four feet to see what goes on. But let's say I'm saying that the drop test was actually that I dropped it. I was working on a construction site. It fell two stories down and then it went off. Well, then we got to test two stories, right? Um, we got to test that. If they're saying that the gun fell over, well, then we're probably going to push it over. Um, now, ideally, you know, I see people saying, how do you do this safely? Ideally, you're doing this with like some sort of thing to drop it. Um, ideally, you're not doing it just you standing, you know, standing out of it. <laughs> of the, did this guy come out of the Fed 3D printer just last week? Um, he does have a bit of a Fed look to him. So... Now, let's skip ahead a little bit, because there's one thing everybody wanted to know, and... Police work, what do you mean by that? Uh, as opposed to training. Oh, and training. So the other nine were done in training, you hit it with the mallet. I, I don't know the exact number, but yes. So this is literally I the hope first I've got time the right in your time career as a forensic stamp. examiner that you've ever, in cases, hit a revolver with a hammer. That is correct. So, um, is it fair to say you've never had the situation where you've hit a revolver and it's broken before? Uh, not in a case. Okay. Did that happen in training? I don't know about it specifically being a revolver, but yes, I have done it in training where the firearms do break. And you earlier told, told us that you base your discretion on that accidental discharge test on input given to you about what might have happened. Not the accidental discharge test. That would be the drop test. Drop test. So you didn't have any information this was hit with some kind of hammer on the rest set, correct? That's correct. I did not. Okay, but you chose to do this, and then you I run you drop hit tests it, on hit computer components. With the um, hammer resting in the So do I, position, but only right? by accident. Yes. And then you did in the full cock position, correct? It was not in that order, but you are correct. Okay, and I'm not, I'm not trying to um, mix it up. But when you hit it with the full cock position, that's when you broke the internal components. Yes. Now, do you know how hard you hit that? I do not. So on a drop test, would you agree with me, you're trying to eliminate variables. Um, so in other words, gravity is the same. By the way, I want to say that that note passing there was very smooth. Um, one thing that happens is sometimes you've got to get a message to your co-counsel, right? you got to say, like hey, wrap it up, or the ju you're losing the jury, or something, right? Um, and so you want to hand them a note. And they did that real smoothly. He didn't break his flow. She just hands him the note. She's going to look over it. Um, you know, that there's a skill to that. So, yeah, land the plane. Um, I ran a drop test on my kid. He's fine. <laughs> uh, I'm just trying to get to... I'm just going to pull this down to see if I can find it in the... Um, uh, where is, sadly, it doesn't show the text. I'm just trying to find the, uh, the critical moment where he talks about, right? Sure. Grabbing my timestamps so are not four feet super every great. time. And you know, the weight of that gun, you're eliminating variables, correct? I suppose so. Okay. Well, have you been taught that at all in the FBI? Uh, no, the purpose of these tests is not to figure out exactly I'm what trying to find exactly the uh, force or exactly how many numbers of times you have to strike this firearm to get it to fire. It's just, to, it's just to try to generally replicate the situations and see if the firearm will fire without pulling the trigger. Well, sir, so did you ever measure the, the trigger pull force on that go. revolver? I did. You did? Yes. What was the trigger pull force? Uh, may I refer to my notes? Yes, sir. Between two and two and a half pounds. Two and a half pounds, okay. Did you measure the weight of that firearm? The weight of the... Of the revolver? No. Okay. So, and you have no idea the foot-pounds of pressure that you were applying to that hammer when you hit it with the mallet, correct? Right. There's no way to quantify that. And there's no way to quantify when you do that six times if you're hitting it the same amount every time, right? That's correct. So a lot of people, lots of people sent me messages going, hey, um, what the hell? Uh, what is, uh, they were saying, hey, what the hell? What is trigger pull? And what what's a trigger pull weight? And does it matter that it's two to two and a half pounds? 
Well, the trigger pull weight is how much force it takes to make the trigger do the thing, right? How much force it takes to take make the trigger go bang. So theoretically, if you took the trigger and you put weights on it, when would it go bang? And so, you know, this is two pounds. Now you might say, wait, two pounds, that's a lot. It's actually super light. This is a really light pull on a pistol, which is really, really common when you're talking about a single action uh, revolver. It's not a hair trigger, but it's a light trigger. And I can say this particular, um, this particular trigger uh, would be very easy to make go off. It's a pretty, but it's very common for a single action pistol. A double action pistol um, might, for instance, if I'm looking, I've got a gun, which is a SIG P226. It fires either, uh, your first shot is a double action shot. And what that means is that your first shot pulls the, the hammer back and then makes it fire, right? So it does both of those things. But after that first shot, you know, when it pulls all the way back and then fires, the action of the slide moving back actually keeps the hammer back. So the next shot will have the hammer already back. And so that second shot out of my P226 will be a single action shot. What that means is that the first shot has a fairly heavy trigger pull. And the second and further shots will have a much lighter trigger pull. And <laughs> somebody just pointed out the uh, the freeze frame here. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, why does this matter? Well, police will typically be carrying guns with a fairly heavy trigger pull. And the reason why is because they want the police to mean it if they're um, if they're pulling the trigger, right? They don't want the police to put, you know, have this pointed at somebody and to, you know, they don't want it to be some sort of involuntary muscle reaction or something like that. The I can say the trigger pull on this gun is light enough that um, you may not. Like, if your finger is on the trigger, you could pull this trigger, e like, fairly easily without really intending it, without really being like, I am absolutely hammering on this trigger. So, um, the question then is, why does any prop weapon need a feather-like trigger? I'm going to tell you, they did no trigger work on this gun. Like, they didn't, they didn't adjust the trigger pull. This is just the trigger pull fact like from the factory right so this is um this is exactly it so uh that's that's what this means right and there is really nothing special about this trigger pull for this gun if that sort of uh if that sort of gets you you know if that sort of explains it. So why is the lawyer talking about it? Um, I think the lawyer, the lawyer was going to, like he asks a follow-up question that is a really weird follow-up question. He asks, how did you weigh the gun? And the weight of the gun doesn't matter, right? The weight of the gun doesn't matter for this. It's, so I think he was going to ask something like that. And he does, he asks as well, like how many foot pounds, uh, each hammer strike has. And it's like, okay. Um, he's basically trying to poke some holes in this. He's not being super effective at, at this. Um, and then we get into some weird discussions in a little bit here. It gets weird. It gets weird. Um, submission, written submission for what he wants you to do, correct? Uh, as far as the communication, is that what you're referring to? Yes, sir. I'm referring to your report. Um, there is a submission October 28, 2021 from Jose Cortez requesting various tasks to be done. Yes. Okay. And then there's another one 
Twelve fourteen. I, my timestamps are not so always the greatest. That goes back and forth between the sheriffs and yourself, and he makes those requests. That's correct. Okay. Now, so you got permission to possibly destroy this revolver permanently. They gave that to you. I received permission to conduct the test. And you made it aware to them that this could destroy the weapon. Yes. Okay. When you did uh, destroy that, you broke several internal parts. Yes. Okay. And then we saw that on the exhibit. You took those apart to show what what had happened. Correct. Correct. Okay. Now, you also said that you did not see any modifications as to that firearm, correct? At what point? You testified that in your functionality examination, you also uh, determined whether it had been modified or not. You, you right. So that's generally in regards to things like, has the barrel been cut? Has the stock been cut? Has this been modified to fire fully automatic? So when I talk about modifications, that's what I'm referring to. And I did not see any of those things. Okay. And as far as internal modifications, you did, did you look at that? No, because I can't disassemble the firearm because I have to test it in the condition it's received. Okay, but from your uh, viewing it. Okay, let's um, let's put this back down to normal speed. We're gonna back him up a little bit. Okay. We're gonna we're gonna listen to this again. You testified that in your functionality examination, you also t uh, determined whether it had been modified or not. You. you right. So that's generally in regards to things like has the barrel been cut? Has the stock been cut? Has this been modified to fire fully automatic? So when I talk about modifications, that's what I'm referring to. And I did not see any of those things. Okay. Now, I hope to God, I hope to God that he's talking about, like, normally? Like, that I, like, that these are things he would check just for other cases and not this case? Because I can tell you, um... Nobody out there is making a sawed-off, fully automatic revolver. <laughs> um, chat. Nobody is making a sawed-off, fully automatic revolver. Because, um, it would actually be really hard to make a fully automatic revolver, um, other than just making a thing to activate the trigger repeatedly, because a revolver doesn't actually use any of the gases from <laughs> yeah um <laughs> I'm just like oh my god that is <laughs> yeah that's the most fear fed imaginary gun I've ever heard of um somebody yeah nobody out there is making a sawed off fully automatic revolver and the gunsmith community took that personally yeah, um, I'm actually going to, at some point, um, at some point I am going to, um, uh, when I get my business firearms license, I'm going to make a very academic, uh, question about handguns and I need to get a hold of one in order to, to do it, but, um, yeah, there is a semi-automatic revolver. Fair enough. I guess somebody could get the Matiba and, um, but yeah, um, yeah, um, a Webley Fosbury could be possibly be made full auto. Don't make a full auto revolver. Um, so, uh, yeah. So uh, the other thing is that at this at the end of this guy's testimony, the witnesses are reminded to stay off the live stream. So there's more of that. Um, <laughs> I like this one. Um, my match pistol went full auto during a match, fired all five rounds very fast. It got very quiet at the range. It would, it would. Um, what is that? Uh, chat here designing a full auto revolver for the U.S. military MPs. How about a belt-fed revolver? I mean, that's not a revolver. Um, all right, so let's let's call this enough, right? We'll call this enough. We're going to move on to um, our next witness, who is Shannon Prince. Um, and she is at about uh, hereabouts. I'm to remind um, 
any witnesses in this case that haven't been called except expert witnesses to stay off the live stream. Raise the judge and raise the right hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. All right, have a seat talking to the microphone. Now, I have seen a ton of people online commenting about her appearance. Um, I'm not going to do that other than to say um, when she starts talking, it actually looks like her mouth is in pain. And I feel bad for her because she's got braces on. And I remember when I had braces and it sucked. I think she's hurting as she's testifying. I think it actually that she's in some physical pain because I see her like sort of working her mouth there and I'm going like ah but I'm not gonna you know I'm not gonna sort of yeah um now this witness has a very very lecturing style and so uh what I mean by that she's got a very like her style is very much like teaching the the room She'd be like a good university educator. Crime good spies, morning. you will not. Good I did morning. not allow any pictures to be taken for, for like a my decade. My name is Shannon Prince. My last name is spelled P-R-I-N-C-E. And where are you currently employed? I'm currently employed at the FBI laboratory in Quantico, Virginia. And what's your title at the FBI? I am a physical scientist, forensic examiner. How long have you been, been employed in the that's what I mean by I think she's in some pain. Did you see that motion she made? I think she's hurting. Um, so I don't want to mock her like people have been giving her shit. I am a physical scientist, forensic examiner. How long have you been, been employed in the latent? She, so she did really well testifying. And if she did it while she's rocking some physical pain from having her teeth adjusted then she's a fucking badass. So, uh, Julia says, didn't you say you had braces during the Canadian Supreme Court appearance? No, I didn't have braces during that. Um, so, I just feel really bad for her, like, if she's dealing with that pain. Print discipline. Over 19 years. And are you a member of any professional organizations related to your employment? Yes, I am. I'm a member of the International Association for Identification. And do you instruct any courses in the latent print uh, uh, discipline? Yes, I do. I instruct courses on latent print processing, which is using chemicals to develop latent prints, as well as post-mortem processing, which is using fingerprints to identify the unknown deceased. And do you take proficiency tests as part of your uh, ongoing um, work at the FBI? Yes. Um, how often and how many? I take one proficiency test each year in comparing prints, and I've taken one test every five years in processing uh, latent prints. Have you ever failed a proficiency test? No, I have not. All right. Okay, so that's her sort of telling us how good she is, which we would hope she is. Um, so she is the latent print an analyst person. This item. So this item of evidence is an ammunition box, and it's semi-porous, meaning it's shiny paper, but it also has non-porous qualities. So the first examination I do is simple visual examination, looking to see if there's any visible prints. You do this every day when you see fingerprints on your cell phone or on a garage door or a mirror. That's a visual examination. So I first do that exam. And then I take this box into a dark room where I have a green light or a laser, a blue light or an ultraviolet light, and I shine that light on the object while I'm wearing orange or yellow goggles to see if any prints may fluoresce. This is very, very much a lecturing style. I'm pretty sure she's done some teaching, some, you know, teaching to people and that kind of thing. Um, like this is, this is, you know, that's that kind of style. Now I'm just going to say um, this style of, of delivery works really well for some jurors. And 
not at all for others. Um, some jurors will find this to be too practiced, to be too, um, too sort of glib and too whatever. So, um, but I found her to be very, I found her to be very direct. I found her to be very understandable and her evidence is largely just kind of meaningless here. It's not she's here to testify just so that the other like just so that the defense lawyer can't say you haven't heard from a fingerprint lawyer or a fingerprint expert that's what she's here for so at this point i've used no chemicals on this item the next process i use is called super glue fuming where i place this item in a chamber i hang it in a chamber and then in the chamber i heat super glue at a high temperature the, the superglue starts to fume. It starts to appear like white fumes. Those fumes adhere to any kind of moisture that might be on that object. And it creates a white print. And I can either see that. She is dumbing this down for the jury. Um, because usually what you'll hear from these fingerprint experts, usually you'll hear them say uh, that like cyanoacrylate fuming. And what is cyanoacrylate? It's superglue usually these experts, when I hear them talking, they say cyanoacrylate. She says super glue. She's really dumbing it down, but, you know, so... And I appreciate that. I I like her as a witness. I, I would... I mean, she'll never work for me as a defense... like, as a defense counsel, but, you know, that, um... I, I would I would hire her. She's a good witness. Print visually, or I need a reflective ultraviolet light exactly this. to be able to see those prints. Then I also do a magnetic powder right after that process. The magnetic powder is black since it's the white box, so it's contrasting. And I can see if there's any uh, visible prints that way. The black powder, black magnetic powder, adheres to the white superglue prints. And then I take this box and use a chemical called indanedione, I-N-D-A-N-E-D-I-O-N-E. -E. This is a chemical that is sprayed on the item, and then it is placed in a humidity chamber where a chemical reaction is sped up. She's spelling it out so that the students in the room can, can write it down for their notes. Um, definitely got that teacher thing going on. This chemical... It, um, develops any kind of amino acid that may be in your sweat and it creates a pink or orange print. Hi Sophia, good night. Um, and I can see that print either visually or in a dark room with a light source. And finally, I take a fluorescent dye stain and I spray this orange chemical on this box and it adheres to those super glue prints as well and I can see those prints in a dark room with an ultraviolet light or a laser. And just to be clear, you did all of that. You did all of those tests with regard to the box that's in this photograph, correct? Yes. All right. And what was the result of your testing? On this box, I... Now, I just want to say, this is why I really like this witness. Um, you can have a juror who's just walked in, and what is their job? Their job is shoveling out horse shit at the, you know, at the local, like, the local farm. Or their job is, you know, whatever, Right. Um, you can have somebody who is 0% academic and at the end of it, I feel like you would probably walk through understanding what this, what she did and what it was about, right? You feel, this is the kind of explanation that makes you feel smart, uh, by listening to it. And one of the things I always say is that if you, if you know something, you should be able to explain it to somebody who doesn't know that thing. There's plenty of lawyers who are great at explaining, lo like, explaining law to other lawyers. But if you really know the law, the test for it is can you explain it to people who have never actually read a legal text and don't know any of this, right? So I think she's doing a great job. And when she explains it f at, like, lay people levels... She doesn't make it sound like she thinks you're a moron for not being at her level. So, um, 
I I like her. I I like her. Um, is it a bad sign if you still feel lost after the explanation? No, um, not at all. Um, that, yeah. I de developed 10 latent fingerprints. All right. Um, did you compare the latent prints that you detected uh, on Exhibit 63 to the known prints of any individuals? Yes, I did. Which individuals did you compare those known prints to? I compared these prints to Hannah Gutierrez, Sarah Zachary, David Halls, and Alec Baldwin. And did you find a match? Yes. Who did you find a match for? Two of these latent prints were identified to Hannah Gutierrez. All right. And were you able to find matches to any of the other known samples? No. All right. And were you able to exclude any of the other individuals uh, based on your test? The remaining prints were excluded as being prints from Sarah Zachary, David Halls, and Alec Baldwin. Thank you. Okay. Did you, mi did you catch the missing name in there? Because defense counsel certainly did. Defense counsel knew this already. Um, so defense counsel uh, is going to point out that there's a name that was missing on that list. And that name is Seth Kenny. Seth Kenny is the key to all of their comments, right? Um, so she says two of those prints are from Hannah Gutierrez. That leaves two prints unaccounted for. Could they be Seth Kenny? And this is on a box of ammunition. So, um, that is kind, that's kind of a thing. Now she's going to go on and tell us about why we might not get latent prints on cartridge cases. So let's try to hear that. This box. Great. And what was the result of your examination of this box? There were three latent fingerprints detected on this box. All right, and were you able to compare those latent prints to the known samples of any individuals? Yes. And who were those folks? I compared the three latent fingerprints to Hannah Gutierrez, Sarah Zachary, David Halls, and Alec Baldwin. And did you find any positive matches for any of those individuals? There were no identifications. Were you able to find any exclusions? Yes. Uh, Sarah Zachary and Alec Baldwin were excluded from the three latent prints detected on this item, and Hannah Gutierrez and David Hall were inconclusively compared to these prints. All right. So just to be clear, Sarah Zachary, you didn't find her fingerprints on this box whatsoever? The three latent prints were excluded from being Sarah Zachary. Great. Um, is it possible to touch an item and not leave a latent print? Yes. And, and what kind of circumstances might that occur? There are several circumstances where you can touch an item and not leave a latent print. First of all, you could be wearing gloves or a mitten, and when you touch an object, you may not leave a latent print because your skin is not having contact with that object. I, you might not, when you touch an object, you might not leave a latent print if you're not actually touching the object. Like, okay, cool, thanks. Um, now, she's being thorough, but when I was listening to this, I was like, thanks, chips. Um, like, okay, like, but, yeah. You may have too much sweat or too little sweat on your hand, and that may not leave a latent print. The surface itself may be dirty or textured, and it's difficult to leave a latent print on a dirty or textured surface. The print may be on a surface where if it's overhandled, such as if I put my hand here, and the next person comes and put their hand here, someone at the end of the day puts another hand here, it's overhandled, and that could wipe away any prints that may be on an item. This, by the way, is also why a lot of people get really, um, they say like, oh, this person left prints, and it's on something like, you know, the push bar on a door, and they're like, why aren't you, t like, why aren't you fingerprinting the push bar of this door, like for an exit door? And it's like, well, no shit, because everyone has touched this and you're not going to get useful fingerprints because it's just going to be this mass of prints. Ideally for fingerprinting, what you want is something that only the person that you're worried about has touched. So um, as an example, I had a situation where there was a break in. Um, this was one of my files and left behind was a can of pop. Um, you know, can of pop. 
And they they noted, like, the people who live there are like, we don't drink pop, ever. It didn't come from our house. The burglar brought in a can of pop, was probably drinking it as they were burglaring, and left it behind. So, um, it was like, okay, they went and got fingerprints, they got DNA off of that. And that was really awkward for my client, whose DNA and fingerprints were on that can, to explain. You know, how do we explain this? And once again, my um, people saying soda versus pop. I mean, this is a regional thing, guys. Soda, pop, Coke. Um, yeah. And people are like, that's a master criminal. The thing is, you have to realize most of most criminals are not super smart and how does the government have your DNA in the case in question? It's because Guy had committed other crimes and they put his DNA into the DNA databases because he committed other crimes. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Um. There's also environmental conditions. Wind, rain, snow... Um, heat and humidity, those can all play a factor of whether a latent print is detected on an item. And did you attempt to do any uh, examination of cartridge casings in this case? Yes. And what was the result of that examination? I examined four cartridge cases and there were no suitable latent prints detected on those cartridge cases. And is it unusual for you to, uh, for you to be unable to identify a latent print on a cartridge casing? It is not unusual. And why, why not? Cartridge cases, when they go through a firearm, there's a lot of heat and friction, and that can destroy a latent print. Also, it's a very small surface that's on a cartridge case, so leaving a suitable print can be difficult. Um, and it's also a smooth surface, so any kind of movement that comes into contact with a cartridge case may destroy a print on a cartridge case. Great. Why is she being asked to testify about this? Because defense is going to be saying... Um, why, like, the defense is going to be saying, listen, we don't have any fingerprints for Hannah on this, you know, on the cartridges that, um, you know, on the casings for the, the bullet that was fired and killed uh, Helena Hutchins. That's the defense argument, right? Where are the fingerprints? Where? Why are there not fingerprints here? And so what they've got her testifying to is to say it's not unusual to have fun. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's not unusual to not find fingerprints on um, on these things because you just like they're often not there. You will touch tons and tons of stuff during the day and not everything will be suitable for fingerprinting. In fact, one of the places like just as an example, um, and I'm just going to see if I can bring it up or if I don't have enough lead to this. Um, my mouse, right? I got a mouse. It's a shiny mouse, right? And so um, let's say you go to fingerprint the mouse. Uh, and you might think, well, obviously there's going to be fingerprints on, you know, on the buttons of the mouse because Runkle's got his hands on those all the time. He's pressing the buttons of his mouse all the time. It's actually a pretty awful surface for fingerprinting because I'm touching it all the time, right? And your hands will slide upon it. Your hands will, you know. So if you actually tried to fingerprint the mouse, what you're probably going to get is this big, ugly smear of, you know, finger goo. Uh, and fingerprints are usually finger goo, if that makes sense, right? Because... Um, you know, you, your hands are sort of sweaty and oily. The oil sweat, like the oily sweat is a great fingerprinting medium. Like if I touch this glass, I can leave a fingerprint and I can see the fingerprint right now. Whereas um, there's other things that can be great, um, great transfer medium media for fingerprints. Um, if you, for instance, get some like cooking oil on your fingers if you have too much, you're not going to leave good fingerprints. But if you have just the right amount, you might get perfect prints. Um, you could imagine the worst case scenario criminal 
which is somebody who gets their hand and touches an ink pad and then touches a surface, like a nice flat surface, and leaves a like a beautiful print. But that doesn't happen a lot of the time. And if you were to sit there and, you know, coat your fingers in black ink and just, like, touch stuff, you'd find that a lot of the things you touched did not actually have good prints on them. So, yeah. What does the Pope use to buy things online? He uses PayPal. Nice. So, all right. Uh, let's see. What else did I want to cover for her? Um, all right. So now we're going to go to cross-examination. And uh, you'll notice that Bowles is doing all the heavy lifting yes. today. So here you had four people as standards. Is that correct? Yes. And that was Mr. Halls, Sarah Zachary, Alec Baldwin, and Hannah Gutierrez-Reed. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, so one of those people you did not receive standards uh, from is a guy named Seth Kenny, correct? Correct. And so of all the other people on the set, the only four you received standards from were those four? That is correct. Okay. And those standards included Latin prints, I mean uh, fingerprint cards, and DNA? The standards I received were fingerprints and palm prints from Gutierrez, Zachary, and Halls, and I only had a fingerprint card for Alec Baldwin. Okay, you didn't have a palm print for him? I did not. Now, I know from, I know that uh, you had stated that Halls and Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, Mr. Halls and, and her prints were not completely rolled, or they were overrolled. Correct. Their known standards were not complete. There was some over-inking in one area, um, and when a fingerprint card is fully rolled, it's usually from nail to nail where you can get the whole finger. This case, on some of these standards, the finger wasn't fully rolled completely. Therefore, I did not have enough information to do a conclusive comparison. I really like her as a witness, and I this is a good this is a good cross. Um, in the sense that he's pointing out, hey, you didn't get Seth Kenny, right? That's exactly what he needs to get. You didn't test Seth Kenny, right? And he also says, and your prints were not the greatest because they weren't. But you see her, she's acknowledging the, um, she's acknowledging the, the weaknesses in her evidence. And she's doing it fully and freely. When we saw the last witness, the, the firearm guy, on cross-examination, he started to get a bit defensive. He started to get a bit touchy. He wanted to dodge the questions. She's not dodging shit. She's like, yep, you're you're right. Those, there were problems with that. You betcha. And I like her. <laughs> like, I... Um, she's a great witness. Um... I always sort of have the, at the end of the trial, is this a witness I would buy a beer kind of test? And I would buy this witness a beer. I think she is a good witness. I think she is an honest witness. I I liked her. So, um, yeah. Next up, we have a guy you probably forgot existed. If you watched the trial... You probably forgot this dude exists because, um, who the F cares? Um, and I'm sorry to the guy, but, um, let's see. It is an hour out. We had lunch break in here. You probably forgot this guy exists. And I'm sorry to the guy. I'm sure he's a nice dude. I'm sure he's like, yeah. Yeah, and this is the thing. Oops. You look biased if you're an expert witness, but you don't want to cooperate with the fence. Yep. I like her. <laughs> you may be seated. It's not camera grip. 
I'm talking about the guy you forgot about, not the Castle. guy you definitely remember. Because you definitely remember mm -hmm. camera grip. Do you have your... Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, thank you. Have a seat talking to the microphone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you doing today? Now, I'm just going to note, uh, this guy's tie, tying game is not perfect, but he's so much better than the first Fed we saw this morning. Um, the first Fed we saw was, yeah. Uh, ferret funds. So, Ian, I'm an Edie Berry girl, so what's with all the gun talk of cock, half cock, grip and all? I'm innocent, really, and don't understand all these references. So, the revolver in question has several places that the hammer can stop and rest and those are the cock positions i know um there isn't a way to to describe this does doesn't sound like i'm describing like instructions for the world's most boring orgy so um when the hammer is all the way back and ready to fire that is full cock Half cock is an intermediate position that is where that re releases the cylinder and allows for the, you know, allows for loading and unloading. Quarter cock is a position that just exists as a safety feature. So you put it into quarter cock so that it uh, keeps the hammer off the uh, off the cartridges. So, yeah. And where do you think the saying "gone off half cocked" came from? Exactly. Um, if your gun goes off half cocked. That's a problem. Um, <laughs> world's most boring orgy got me full lol moment. Um, just be glad you don't have to explain decocking leather lever. I'll explain decocking lever. Um, so I have a Sig P226 and it has a decocking lever. And so what that is is if you've got something like you've got your gun cocked and you want it to not be cocked anymore. So you kind of want to neuter your gun so it's not going to go off as easily, which hence you want it decocked so it doesn't go off as easily. Um, you pull, you push that little lever down and that allows it to be, to be released from the full cock position without going off prematurely. So yeah. Okay. Um, so this guy is an FBI, well, we'll let him tell it. I'm doing well, thank you. Great. Would you please uh, state your name for the record? My name is Robert Gillette, last name spelled G-I-L-L-E-T-T-E. -E. And where are you currently employed? I am employed by the Federal Bureau of Investigation within the Explosives Unit, which is part of the Laboratory Division. And how long have you worked for the FBI? I started with the FBI in 2009 as a contractor. I was hired on. Oh, I think Emily showed up at just the right moment. And what's your official title? My official title is chemist, forensic examiner. And how long have you been working as a chemic, <laughs> uh, a chemic chemist, forensic examiner? For about 11 years now. All right. Can you give us a, a brief uh, wrap up of your educational background? I have a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Science in Chemistry from George Mason University. In okay, so he's been trained to be boring, but specifically trained to be boring about, about chemistry, uh, which is a really easy topic to be boring in. Um, this is what he's about. So we're going to jump to why he is sort of like why he's boring why they brought this boring guy in it's identical smokeless powder composition in them is that correct well they have that this physical appearance right and the shape and size and color okay great now i'd like to show you what has been marked as states exhibit 111b what can you tell me about this photograph 
This is another photograph I took using a microscope. This is item 24-1. All right, and, and what does this picture show? The appearance and the physical characteristics, what we call the morphology, the shape, size, color of, the, of this specific powder. And did you examine more than one item that had this type of powder? Yes, I did. There were six that had this morphology. And, and do you know what the source of those six items was? Uh, the source? Where, oh. where they were found? Is, uh, I recall in one of the uh, laboratory examination requests that received, the source wasn't specifically a location for um, two of them. It was a name, and then um, the others had a, a street address in Albuquerque. Do you recall what the name was? I believe the name was Seth Kenny. And, and do you recall the address? The specific address? No, I think it was Monroe Street in, in Albuquerque. Okay, great. What I'd like to do now, and, and before I do this, all six of the cartridges that you, or the disassembled cartridges, um, that were either identified from as coming from Seth Kinney or from the Monroe Street address have smokeless powder that looks like this. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. All right. Now I'd like to put these kind of side to side. And, and if you can, I know that it's kind of obvious, but could you explain to the jurors kind of what some of the visual differences between these uh, two different types of smokeless powders are? They both have generically the same shape. We would call that disc-shaped. However, the ones on the left are slightly smaller and they're darker in color. The ones on the right are slightly larger and have a single perforation. Okay, so why is this guy testifying? Why do we care? I don't think the prosecution actually does a good job explaining why we give a shit about this guy. Which is important because we actually do give a shit about this guy. Um, he is significant. What he's telling us is that the powder shape for the Seth Kenny bullets that were live bullets is different than the powder shape from the live cartridges that were recovered from the rust set. That is why this guy is testifying. And you might be saying, why does powder have a shape? Like, why is that a thing? Well, one of the things that's really important about powder is how fast it burns. So, um, you might be surprised to note that, like, different powders burn differently. And so, you don't want the powder to burn too fast, because if it burns too fast, it can generate too much sort of impact and be hard on the gun. You don't want the powder to burn too slow, because then it might not get the proper... Like, all of this matters. And somebody says, are these two the same magnification? Yes. Uh, yes, they are. At least I think they are. So, this, this powder, um, yeah, and there's this. This expert witness didn't want to give the answers the prosecution wanted. This guy just wanted to be boring and uncooperative to everybody. Um, so, powders can have different shapes. They can be disc-shaped. They can be rod-shaped. They can be spherical. They can be all sorts of things. But the main issue is how much surface area they have. So a powder that is a sphere is going to have much less surface area for its weight than powder that is pancake shaped. And this additional, um, this additional hole, <laughs> these I'm told are the shoot loops shape. I love that. Shoot loops. So, I mean, but it's got additional surface area based on that additional hole in them. Um, people get really particular about which powders they buy based on how they perform. And so what this guy is telling us is that these are different powders that were found in one place versus the other. And so they managed to make something like the prosecution has this strat like their style of evidence delivery here is basically like we've got a bucket of evidence and we're just going to dump it in your face 
And jury, if you don't understand the evidence that we are dumping in your face, that's on you. And yeah, this is a great comparison. Just like Italians and their pasta shapes holding sauce. Yes. Um, so size and shape does matter. This is significant. Different brands, you know, have all of these things. And like you might prefer the shoot loops versus your shoot discs, I guess. Um, shoot frisbees. So. But the, the like dump the evidence in your face and be like, why don't you understand strategy is really running some risks. <laughs> Size and shape does matter. Ask Linda. Yes. <laughs> uh, you've got to, there is, it takes prosecution all day, like all trials so far to get to a witness who can finally tell a story. And it's not this dude. It's not this dude. Um, this is from Emily. I cannot claim credit for shoot loops because, um, <laughs> you know, that's from Emily's chat. So um, then we get to, you know, some cross-examination points here. Um, so, and this is the first we see of this one, or this lawyer too. Now... Yeah, it's doing the. Uh... Um, and your role in this was not to make sure that, um, like, I guess what I'm trying to say is you had no role in selecting which cartridges um, or which um, powders you were going to test, right? This new lawyer is really, um, she seems a little less polished by comparison to say bowls and there's a couple of things that might be a reason for this um it might be because she just came on this trial today right um she was just brought in like today out of nowhere so i don't think she's had the prep to get now i actually i didn't realize that she was brought in as a new lawyer I, when I first saw her, I was thinking, oh my God, this is probably because they know this guy isn't super important. I thought, my initial thought was that she was a younger, like a junior lawyer who works for Bowles. This was my thought in my head, um, that she came, came in and was like sort of thrown a bone of like, you need to get some trial experience come cross-examine the chemistry guy, the chem forensics guy, because nobody cares if you screw it up. And yeah, that was wrong. I was wrong about that. Um, she's been at this like a decade. So um, I don't think, um, I don't think she's a newbie. I don't think she's a bad lawyer. I think she has just prepared this cross-examination last night, or maybe, maybe she prepared this cross-examination while he was testifying, and that's it. Uh, no, Hannah didn't have bowls removed. She had bullion removed, so we've lost our soup soup team. You, you tested what they gave you. Correct. Um, and you received... It is it true it's the form you received them in um was 11 ziploc bags right yes i believe they were zipper zipper lock style bags and each of the bags had a bullet a casing and a screw top container with some powder in it is that right thank you guys four thousand i believe is, that's uh, i don't think it's a record but it's so a then record since when death. you received so these you items guys. these cartridges they they weren't intact that is correct. They were not intact. The powder was already removed out. That is correct. And do you know who removed the powder out? No, I do not. Okay. Um, now, FBI laboratory, that's where you said you worked on direct. Um, are you aware of a Mr. Ziegler that works in the FBI laboratory as well? Yes, Bryce Ziegler was the assigned examiner in the firearms and tool marks unit. Okay. And was he the one who had these um, items um, prior to you testing them? I believe so, yes. 
uh, and you don't know if, if Mr. Ziegler is the one that removed the powder or if somebody else removed the powder? I'm not certain that it was Mr. Ziegler. I would assume that it was him. Okay. Um, so you can't say if the powder from these cartridges um, was just, was all of it there, or if it was just part of the powder from the cartridges, if it was just a sampling, you, you don't have no way of knowing that, right? I, no, I do not. So you don't know if the powder actually came, in, in addition, you don't know if the powder actually came from the particular cartridge that it was in, in parts in the Ziploc, either. It could have come from a different one. Well, since I didn't disassemble them specifically, no, I can't say that where they specifically came from. Right. So here's the argument she's going with is, hey, isn't it possible they mixed up the ammunition, like the powders? Um, jury is not going to go for this unless you've got some actual serious argument about the chain of custody. And here she's just like, well, you didn't, like, you don't know for certain nobody shuffled it. And he's like, no, but I didn't, and nobody else did. So I don't think the jury's going to, um, I don't think the jury's going to actually put much weight into this argument. I think the jury's going to be like, okay, cool. Um, that's a possibility, but meh. And I think this is a good point here. I wouldn't have even crossed this guy. This guy was so boring. I will say that I think I would cross this guy. But my cross for this guy would probably just be, let's be extra boring. And like, let's get you to like, go through your processes. Like, you know, can you tell us about like, just random shit. And the reason why is just so that the jury, um, I'm not, my cross on this guy in front of a jury isn't that I want to discredit this guy necessarily. It's that I just want to make the jury so bored of this guy that they never actually care about this guy at all. Um, like just by the end of it, I want them to think like, this guy said a lot of mouth noises and I re like my brain curled in on itself and died. That's what I want out of this, out of this cross is just so that everybody thinks that this guy is an absolute nap because he is, um, this is part of the problem with forensics guys is that you get a guy who goes into chemistry and I will tell you, there are some really exciting people who go into chemistry, and none of them work for the FBI. Because um, if you're exciting and you work, you know, you go into chemistry, you probably get a more interesting job than, like, FBI, you know, powder analyst. Um, this is, like, this is also their bomb guy. This is the guy who can manage to make hearing about a bombs construction boring so you just let the jury hate the guy for being boring and they forget the the key bits about the powder i mean eh, i i don't know the worst case scenario is you make this guy feel interesting that's kind of the worst case scenario is that they they get interested in this guy uh, let's see one little bit more for this guy because there is another argument they make and yeah say that they're consistent you can't say that they are from the same source oh if if say that these two powders were not different both physically and chemically the best i could say then was that they are physically and chemically consistent with one another if that guy was that fantastic case which is not the way it is now I've seen, um, so it appears that there were several um, cartridges that were sent to the FBI laboratory for testing beyond the 11. Um, and, and I just wanna make sure you don't have an, a different, uh, an additional report, or you didn't test any of the other cartridges that went to the FBI lab other than these 11? That's correct, I was only given 11 samples to examine. Um, and. You didn't test the, like, literally hundreds of rounds that were found? 
like, oh, Seth Kenny had like a hundred rounds. You didn't test every one of them. I mean, it's an argument you make as defense, but it's always, it's one of those arguments that I always feel bad when you make. So it seems like the purpose of your work is to determine it whether can be, but this guy is not. Right? Well, the I would say the purpose is to determine whether or not the suspected ammunition propellant is ammunition propellant. And and that would be one type of ammunition propellant is smokeless powder that you're looking for, right? Correct. Okay. And you used, in order to do that, you used this whole scientific process you just talked about on direct um, to determine whether these were live rounds, right? You actually had to look at the chemical composition of the powder in order to tell the difference, right? No, I, I never made a determination as to whether or not something was a live round. From my explosives chemistry examinations, I determined whether or not they were explosive, specifically ammunition propellant, specifically smokeless powder. Right. That was not the answer she wanted. Um, this is where this guy being the most boring individual on the planet defeats the defense because he's like, I, I don't know if they're live rounds. I just got bags of bags of powder and like, yeah. Um, but what she's trying to say is like, you needed a lab to tell the difference. So therefore Hannah Gutierrez couldn't have possibly told the difference. And I, the defense is going on this argument over and over and over again. Like, you needed to do all this analysis. You needed to take the bullets apart. You needed to all of these things. And I go, well, um, at the end of the day, though, if you don't know it to be safe, and if there's any uncertainty about whether or not it's safe, it shouldn't go in the gun. So if you need a chemical analysis to determine if it's safe or not, you don't put it into the gun. Um Right, but in order to do that, you actually had to do a chemical composition of the powder to tell the difference, right? Correct. And the technique that you had to do to, to do that um, is, and you were trying to tell if, if this um, it was, I think you said, what, visual microscopic inspection first, right? Correct. And then uh, you also did a thermal susceptibility test. Correct. And then infrared, uh, like spectro... Spectroscopy. Uh, yeah, but the, the spectroscopic <laughs> techniques... I love that he corrects that her. Would, okay. And then um, the there was one more. It was the gas chromatography. Is that right? Correct. All right. So that sounds very scientific here. These tests are all done in a li laboratory, right? Correct. And in order... And that is the way that you determine if this powder is, in fact... An ammunition propellant is this all scientific in the lab kind of stuff correct by following the specific technical procedure that we have and your procedure also produced over 100 pages of notes didn't it um, not specifically notes i would say case notes they were probably shorter than that maybe a dozen or so but all of the instrument data definitely over 100 pages all right um i'm going to switch gears a little bit to you were asked some questions about okay so let's talk about i mean i get why she's doing this She's trying to say, okay, you know, there's all these sciencey things to tell for sure. Um, you know what the other way, you know what the usual way in a criminal case that they can say this is a real cartridge versus this is not? Um, they put it in a gun and they shoot it. That's the usual way they do it. And that's the way Hannah chose to do it is we put it in a gun and we shoot it at Helena Hutchins. Um, Maybe she should have done the scientific method. But, like, let's... Like, this is one of my film dummies, right? I'm using these as a prop because YouTube will not give me crap, I don't... I hope, over having a film dummy on, you know, on screen. And you can hear it rattle, right? But let's imagine that I... That this had, like, a primer in it and it didn't have a BB. I wouldn't know that this is you know, is if this is live or not live. But I certainly would not put it in a gun that was going to be fired on a film set or at all a film. Like, you need to be certain. And I would, like, I would be willing to put this in a gun on a film set because I can visually confirm that there's no primer pocket and I can hear the BB. Only because I can do those things 
would I be willing to put it, if I don't know, if I would have to send it to a lab to get determined, if there's any freaking doubt in my skull, even the slightest inkling in my skull that this would be a, you know, that this would be a live round, I don't put it in the gun on a film set, right? I don't put it in the gun on a film set, period. And this is my point about the cross-examination. Jesus, lady, you're making him look interesting the more you scramble to attack him. Just let him put everyone to sleep. Yes. I actually think that this guy was better off uncrossed. Um, or if they were going to do a cross, just do the, like, sir, can you explain what spectroscopy is? You know, you said you did spectroscopy can you explain what that is and then you said you used a chromatograph could you explain what that is okay why does that work you know how does it you just make the guy as boring as you possibly can and i mean the thing is is i'd be sitting there going like where is this cross-examination going and that would be better than what she did here <laughs> so um yeah, if there are doubts, it goes into the bucket. And then after the shoot, you take the bucket to the range to test it. If I had doubts about it, like if I was a film armor, and I'm not, I'm not qualified to be a film armor. But if I was, and neither is Hannah, but like, let's say I walked on and I had to take over Hannah's job. There's, you know, and there's like a guy with a gun to the back of my head. I need to armor, I need to be a film armor to, to do this or, you know, or else Buddy's going to, you know, shoot me in the back of the head so if i'm required to do that it would be like okay this round i can't tell what you know what it is and i would be like okay we're not using this and then i'd be wanting to break that apart and being like do we actually have a live cartridge on our set what the heck is with this and if i found that was a live cartridge i'd be like stop everything um and I see that somebody's saying, um, what is it? Don't pick up, quit picking on the guy. He didn't ask to be there. Uh, this guy's an expert. He is being paid good money, I think, to be here. So, um, Runkle's dream job, film armor. I mean, film armorers make more money than I, or uh, not more money. They have a cooler job than I do. I don't know if they make more money, but um, they have a cooler job than I do. Um, maybe one day. Maybe one day I could do YouTube law and film armoring. So, yeah. <laughs> of this. His wife falls asleep when he explains how his day went. So, all right. Um, yeah, I might not know all the things to be an armor, but an error on the side of not killing people. You betcha. Uh, all right. Let's, um, what is it? Let's uh, have a look there and, you know, just see what we have next. Next is another witness you forgot existed. We're going to talk about the other witness you forgot exists. Great. Uh, would you please state your name for the record? Yes, my name is Gerilyn Conway. It's spelled J-E-R-R-I-L-Y-N-C-O-N-W-A-Y. And what's your current occupation? I'm a DNA examiner in the DNA casework unit at the FBI laboratory. And what are some of your responsibilities as a DNA examiner? Okay, so she's a DNA examiner. Um, and KVBD Studios, who has done armor work, says, we do not make more money, I promise, at least in the U.S. Fair enough. Um, she is a DNA analyst. What is she here to testify to? She's here to testify that they took DNA from the handle of the gun, which matched to Baldwin and two unknowns. And she's here to testify about why they didn't take DNA off the bullets. So, her, like, her entire reason for being here, really, is to testify about why there's no DNA on DNA tests done on the casings. That's it. And the reason why is because they, if they test for DNA, then they can't test for latent prints. And they're more likely to get latent prints, so they do the latent print testing. Enough of her. Um, she was a good witness, but she is 
really unimportant. Um, she's just here. Yeah, this is. She's just here to cut off a defense line of attack, but that's it. So let's get to the guy we do care about. Um, and he is at. A D D I E G O. Mr. Adiego, how are you currently employed? Um, he makes meth. As a dolly, uh, dolly grip. Can you explain to the lady? God, this guy looks like Heisenberg. <laughs> like, this guy looks like Walter White. And I'm just going to give you guys a, um, a real pro tip if you are ever called upon to testify in court. Um, don't wear what this guy is wearing. Do not wear this. And the reason why is because what he looks like he's wearing is an orange jumpsuit. Which, in some ways, looks like Heisenberg's, like, you know, bunny suit when he's working on meth and wants to avoid contamination. But he really looks like he's wearing an orange jumpsuit. Where do you get an orange jumpsuit, folks? Prison. They dress criminals in orange jumpsuits. So, um, I am going to add this to my list of, please, for the love of God, do not wear this to court. Um, oh my God. Because <laughs> this guy looks like he just walked out of a prison. And this is... Dude, he's wearing Patagucci. Come on. I don't care who manufactures it. Don't wear this to court. Do not wear this to court. Like, uh, yeah. Um, do not. Um, other things to not wear to court. Um, anything that references drugs or crime. So, like, you know, if you're wearing something that, um, you know, says... Um, you know, cocaine and caviar, don't wear that. If you're wearing something that says crooks and castles, don't wear that. Um, if you want to wear like a Sons of Anarchy shirt, freaking don't. Um, if you want to wear a shirt that has a big marijuana leaf or that says, fuck the police, please don't. Um, I will say that when I was doing like, you know, like every time I'm going to trial, I brought a, um, I have a kit and in my bag, I include, yeah. And I had a guy who showed up to court wearing a shirt that said F the police and his charge was assaulting a police officer. And you know how much I want you to be wearing a shirt that says F the police when you are where you know when you're charged with assaulting a cop um the other one i don't want you to wear is yeah this is a good one uh where was that in the chat um chat why are you scrolling so fast um i was a probation officer and always found it helpful when dui clients wore budweiser shirts yep don't do that um the other one I hate is the ones who show up for court wearing stuff that says only God can judge me because you know who else can judge you is judges like judges can judge you and they don't appreciate the only, you know, only God can judge me. Um, the difference between God and a judge is that God doesn't think he's a judge. <laughs> so... Um, Juggalo shirts are not good. No, um, no Scarface, no Soprano, none of this crap. Um, so yeah, um, I have, I will bring an oversized button down shirt. Um, and I will tell you, I got that shirt at Value Village, so I don't know where it came from. I don't know where it it came from at all but um i have 
given that to clients to be like, hey, you're here in a shirt and that shirt is stupid. So you're going to wear this instead. And they're like, what? And I'm like, go to the bathroom, nowsies, and change, please. Like, now. Um, so, yeah, and this is really just the thing, is no shirt with words. No shirt with words um, or pictures. Um, what is Value Village? It's a thrift store. They they sell secondhand stuff. So, and Dirk Schwartz saying, if the defense continues the argument of Gutierrez couldn't have told the difference, when would be the best moment for the prosecution to debunk it the way you did? If you can't tell the difference, don't load it. When they call an armor, that's when they need to do that. They need to call a film armor. Period. Um, so, yeah, this guy looks like um, he looks like Walter White and, um, he, he looks like Walter White and yeah, Value Village is the most expensive thrift store out there. It is, but it was convenient. Um, all right. So what is this guy's role? He is a dolly grip operator. He's going to tell us what that is. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, what a dolly grip does. I um, help the camera department um, in any way possible with camera support. So any camera movement, whether on a dolly, camera cranes, um, rigging a camera to vehicles, I assist them in, in any way that I can as a representative from the grip department. You so on a previous stream, I made a joke about the grips and grips are in fact more important than than i let on because it's fun to make fun of grips because they don't get enough respect on a set but grips actually have an important job the people who have the less important jobs are like you know production assistants where they get told like hey i need a coffee go get a coffee um dolly grip has nothing to do with Gorilla Grip Pussy Pal. Those are different things. Um, dolly grips are any time a dolly that the cameras are on needs to move, this guy or somebody like him does those things. Um, that is really what he's about. And so if you think about any time you have seen in a movie a camera that has moved... This guy is, you know, this guy or somebody like him is the guy. Grips are actually a fairly, um, they're a skilled job. And unfortunately, grips don't get enough regard. I kind of made fun of them as a joke. Somebody called me on it and they were fair to do so because grips are important. And you might say, oh my God, what does it take to move a camera? And I will tell you. Moving a camera is surprisingly difficult and important. Let's say you've got a scene, right? And you've got the scene where the camera moves in on the person and like, you know, zooms in close so that you can get that tension shot. You know, you know, getting that tension shot smoothly is difficult. It's tough. And... Often that's done by just a dude holding a camera, like holding something and moving it. And he might be moving it up, you know, on territory. Like it might be that this camera needs to go up and then down. And it's got to be done smoothly. This guy has an important job. Um, grips also, I saw somebody saying, why do I think grips hold the, the boom mics? They do. And boom mic work is one of those things that seems super interesting and un like super uninteresting and unimportant, um, right up until it matters. Cause you know what happens if the boom mic dips into the frame? Well, they don't use that frame. And you know what happens if the boom mic goes you know, too far? Well, they don't use that either because they need to get the audio and it needs to be clear. All of these things need to be done. Like, they're things that seem unimportant, but they need to be done right. 
So that's what this guy is. Now, why we care that this guy is the Dolly Grip is that the Dolly Grip is going to be working with the cinematographer. And who's the cinematographer here? It's Helena Hutchins. This is the guy who is right next to Helena Hutchins when she gets shot. So, this guy's testimony is going to get a bit emotional. And you should be warned. So, you do this on movie sets? Um, movie sets, television sets, music videos, commercials, yes. I'm also just going to note, this guy, um, it is important to note that this guy also has some stuff going on. Uh, because the, the defense is going to bring it up. So, we're going to bring up the the other thing this guy has going on um because and we're gonna do it before the defense gets to it just so you understand what's going on um so this guy is ross adiago and you can see he's listed here i'm gonna change the layout because oh my god that sucks okay there we go ross adiago he is the plaintiff in a lawsuit that is against Alexander R. Baldwin III, Rust Movie Productions, and El Dorado Pictures. Now, one person you will note is not listed here. The other person who is listed, or who's not listed, is Hannah Gutierrez. Why is he not suing Hannah Gutierrez? Well, because... Alex Baldwin, or Alec Baldwin, and Rust and El Dorado Pictures all have money. And you don't sue people without money. This is one of the basic rules of, you know, of lawyering and so forth. You don't sue people who got no money. Because at the end of the day, you can spend, like... Let's say a homeless guy came over and threw a Molotov cocktail at my house, burns it to the ground, and he's caught on camera, he confesses, I've got him 100% dead to rights. I would not sue that dude. Why? Because at the end of the day, I get a judgment that says this dude owes me all of this money, and he's got no money. Like, what am I going to do? I'm going to sue him for, like, his hobo bindle? No. So, um, they don't list any of the people who have no money in this lawsuit. And that's going to come back to bite him on cross. That is going to be used on cross. Um, so, you know, they are suing, and because they're suing Baldwin and so forth, they're really going to focus on Baldwin and so forth in the suit. They don't really talk about Hannah's role because that will be a... They know in this lawsuit, they know that in fact the defense, like Baldwin, is going to be pointing the fingers at Hannah in this lawsuit. And so they leave it for the defense to do that. But, um, but, yeah... So, um, I'm not making derogatory words about people who are homeless, but the average homeless person does not have millions of dollars. Whereas the average Alec, you know, Alexander Ray Baldwin III does have millions of dollars. You sue the guy with the millions of dollars, not the guy with the tens of dollars. Um, that, yeah. All right, let me just... Pull this up again. All right, let us jump to where things start to get a little spicier. Had filming been going on on the set of Breast uh, prior to October 21st? Um, we were a couple of weeks into it. And when you say a couple of weeks, um, uh, are we talking... Uh, uh, 
how many days are in the work week? I, I, my recollection is we were doing five day weeks, but at some point our weeks shifted. I think we were doing a, a Tuesday through Saturday schedule. So we were 10 to 12 days in, I believe, at that point. Okay, 10 to 12 days of actual filming. Correct. Okay, because you had weekends. Uh, we did. We typically had uh, whatever our union protocol was, two days off, 48 okay. hours or some, some such. Um, now, with regard to all of your um, film credits, can you tell the, the jury approximately how many projects you've worked on uh, where there was an armorer on the crew? Can't give you an exact number, but a uh, dozen or more at this point in my career. And why would a production company hire an armorer? Um, because they plan to use uh, potentially deadly weapons and ammunition. And what is your understanding of what the responsibilities of a set armorer are? You got any so here's the issue that's going to come up over and over and over in this guy's testimony. Prosecution wants to use him as a backdoor armorer. She wants to say, what does an armorer do? Why didn't Hannah do those things? Is it Hannah's fault that, you know, Baldwin shot, you know, Helena Hutchins? This guy's not an armorer. But they're going to get a lot of this in through the process of, you know, you have experience on film sets. I would have shut, if I was the judge, I would have shut a lot of this stuff down a lot sooner. But this is where we're going to start seeing these objections come in because prosecution wants to use this guy for more than he's useful for um this is a good question are we gonna see hannah in the rust credits i think they have to be um i think they have to be i think they have to put her in the credits so um unless maybe they like got her to agree not to that would be interesting all right so they want to use this guy for more than he should be. On but... those other movies engaged in when they would bring a firearm onto set for use in filming a scene. Your Honor, I'm also going to object to relevance. What happened on other movies has no relevance to what happened on Rust. <laughs> now that is a hell of an objection because they are going to be relying on industry standards. And how do you get to industry standards is by what else is there and yeah this is the thing is um uh by industry standards she does have to be in the credits unless she waives that or unless she asks to be like you know smithied so they might actually have gone to her and been like you need to be not you know we will i mean at this point i might be like hey um you know, Hannah, we'll give you ten grand to not be in our credits. And I mean at that point she might want to take it. Response. Can we approach? Sure. They also do a lot of speaking objections in this, and they shouldn't. Prosecution's like let's approach rather than doing the whole speaking objection. Uh, why would she want to be in the credits? I think she still wants to be an armorer. I think she still wants to be an armorer. So, um, I think she hopes that she'll be acquitted here and that she'll go on to be an armorer again. Uh, do you think the prosecution sh uh, should have just brought up his lawsuit to get out of the way? I would have if I was the prosecution. I think, um, so tactical, like trial tactics. Sometimes you've got a witness who has really bad elements to them, right? Like, um, you know, usually if you are calling the witness and they have something really 
bad about them. I want to bring that up, right? I want to bring up that detail. So um, if I'm calling a witness whose, you know, character might be like, I might say, okay, um, you know, I've asked a, a witness, like, what do you do for a living? And I know that his answer is drug dealer, right? I know his answer is drug dealer. This was not my client. This was another witness. And so I wanted the person to be like, um, okay, cool. Um, you know, he says he's a drug dealer because I know the prosecution when they cross examine him is going to get that out, right? They know that they're going to, they're going to reveal that detail, so I want to deal with it and make it and handle it. In this case, his bad detail is that he is suing Baldwin. I would have done some exploration of that because the defense gets to hammer him with it and make it look like it's a um, make it look like it's something the prosecution was hiding. And yeah, this is the thing. Um, even if she's acquitted, she's not going to work in the field again. But um, I can't really go into the details. I have some information that suggests she really wants to try to to get back in as armoring. So uh, I don't. I think it's delusional. But yeah. And now we're zoomed in on. I mean, at least there's nothing else to look at. But you know. We got Hannah here. Um, so, you, of course, she's going to look bored. Although, I'm just going to tell you um, Hannah is going to start looking less bored and more angry during this. You're going to see moments where Hannah looks like she wants to get up and punch this dude. And. These two do not like each other. These two do not get along. Um, they, they, they're, they're not going to be going for coffee anytime soon. So, um, yeah. Now, here's the fun thing. Um, this Rust, the credits... The credits for Rust are going to include, you know they're going to include, um, you know uh, that they're going to include a, you know, um, you know, to the memory of Helena Hutchins, right? And can you imagine how gross it'll be if it'll be like Armorer, you know, Hannah, and then, um, you know, that... And guys, we've got a little. We're gonna take a little bit of a break here because we've got a special guest. Hello. Hi. Hi. How's it going? It's going all right. Um, so this is Ari Jacob, who is um, <laughs> up until recently was locked in litigation with uh, Taylor Lorenz. Yes. And yes. I'm free I'm now. I'm free now. <laughs> and I gotta fix this. I don't have echo. There oh. we go. That should fix it. That's okay. my fault. Was That's it not me? your okay. fault. <laughs> No, it was it was all me. That was okay. my fault. So you're free of the lawsuit. Um, so from what I, I understand, uh, we covered this like um, uh, last Monday, I think. Um, and then, by the way, I didn't know we were gonna we were gonna dismiss it um, when you were covering it. So it's kind of funny how how things kind of went down quickly. But um, but yeah, so. What do you want to know? You're the first person I've talked to outside of Twitter, which, by the way, I I announced on Twitter that it was a win for me. And all sorts of people had all sorts of uh, things to say because they, you know, I announced it was a win for me and explained why. But, um, you know, I think people may want to know if I'm being <laughs> honest about it and why. <laughs> no, fair. I mean, it sounds no. like no money changed hands. That uh... No, so I think what people don't realize is that um, the New York Times specifically has a no settling policy. Right. So they do not settle uh, if they think that they're right. And I don't know if they've gone into any litigation for defamation where they, they don't think that they're right. Um, so basically they don't settle. Um, you know, 
I think, you know, had they um, agreed to mediate, um, I, you know, there's all these things I didn't know about the law, like, or just about lawsuits. For example, things like, um, you know, deposition costs, cost money, um, mediation costs, you have to pay the mediator like 10, 15 grand each. And um, there's all sorts of expenses that, you know, while um, my, my, uh, my attorneys that were, were leading the case, um, they took the case because they believed in me. And, you know, it's, a, that was a whole ordeal is even getting a, an attorney to take this case. I don't think, I don't know if anybody can find it, but I doubt you're going to find any case with a, uh, a well-known attorney that um, took it for contingency because, I mean, the New York Times hasn't lost a defamation case, according to them, since I think the 1960s. So it's a pretty so, big Goliath I was up against. So as a as background, you were running sort of uh, various influencer houses kind of thing, right? Like yeah, uh, well, these content gonna, houses? Yeah, so if I was a talent manager and... You know, I basically spent a lot of my career um, in the social media space. I worked at a digital agency. I did all sorts of stuff. And, you know, to be honest with you, I worked for free for a lot. Like I was the kind of person working three jobs, you know, and, and my third job was like I, I worked for free for Canelo Alvarez, the boxer. I did all his social media, all sorts of different um, people. And then I think by the time I, I felt like, OK, I can charge for what I'm doing, um, that was around the time when TikTok um, started to get really popular, which is was at the end of 2019. And so uh, basically, when the pandemic happened, the only people making money in entertainment were influencers because everybody was on their phones and there was no productions going on in Hollywood. And, um, it, you know, Hollywood, which is already pretty cutthroat, it got even more cutthroat because all these talent agents were getting uh laid off and stuff like that and so i think you covered it in in your last video that you did about this that um that i didn't even know see i had a lot of naivete i think that i will say i i have some fault in this is that i was just naive i thought you know i came from san diego hospitality where it's like <laughs> you know you, you you're you, you do something for someone they do something nice back to you it's kind of like a reciprocity and in, in Hollywood they stab you just right in the front <laughs> they don't even wait till you turn around so yeah and people are asking is are we done with rust we're not done with rust we're doing a little bit of an intermission because this yeah, was a case I covered and if we don't sort of cover it today we're not going to end up covering it so I wanted to sort of have an intermission here to talk about uh, what's going on yeah um, thank you so and I, I won't be I won't be on for too long so we have my boyfriend and I watching The Bachelor tonight. <laughs> oh, nice. Um, so, um, Ari Jacob, you know, just as a bit of an intro here, uh, you know, I sort of mentioned you were running some content houses and you ran afoul of Taylor Lorenz, who, um, for those of us who watched the Depp trial, um, we know that she's kind of a fan of sort of hit piece journalism. And some of those really um some of those are better aimed than others but she um she decided to do a piece where she accused you of all sorts of things including publicly leaking some nudes right and right so some of those claims got thrown out because it's just really difficult to like some of your you know defamation claims got thrown out because it's really difficult to um to establish like actual malice in those pleadings. But that one, they because Taylor Lorenz had expressed that she didn't believe it in emails, that got um, you know, yeah. that sort of carried on. So So bas yeah, basically I was working with influencers and had my head down in this industry. Taylor Lorenz was a journalist and she she was actually represented. I was a talent agent and and Taylor had a talent agent at a big talent agency. And uh, after she did the article, a bunch of my clients went to her agency. So, you know, when this kind of thing happens to you and you're not, you don't understand even like, how, you know, what, what do you even do when something like this happens? You immediately want to be like, well, this isn't lawful. Like, you know, this, how could they legally lie about me and get away with it? And I very quickly learned that, um, 
uh, so, like it was more likely than not that I wasn't going to be able to do anything about it. So I actually did try to move on with my life. And um, I tried to start a, a new business that I always wanted to build a platform for influencers, like a mentor in your pocket kind of thing to like, I think you were talking about uh, on the last stream that it would be cool if you had a manager, but that it was just something that somebody like an assistant that would help you. So I wanted to build that. And I actually started raising capital to build it right after, you know, about like six months after the hit piece that Lorenz did. And Lorenz started calling people in the media that were uh, this one woman in particular that was going to cover my story about not about Taylor, but about building this new platform for influencers right. and kind of like, what is my comeback? And and Taylor w went around calling um, pub, um, like she called that woman's boss and ranted to her, uh, ran to her boss that I was a literal abuser that didn't uh, deserve positive press in the media and all this stuff. And so at that point, I'm like, you know, this person like doesn't want me to exist, you know, like she doesn't want me to be able to have a roof over my head. And and that really like lit something under me to say, OK, I've got to find a way to file this uh, lawsuit so I can vindicate myself. And um, and I filed a lawsuit. And and by the way, the, the claim about the nude images, um, what happened is I was managing a 25 year old guy and these these influencers lived in content houses. And the 25 year old guy, um, somebody, another manager sent me a text message and said, hey, I just want you to know that there's like a big uh, public chat room and there's an allegation that uh, your guy, the 25 year old, sent nude photos to a 14 year old girl. So immediately I felt I had a, um, you know, um, a duty, an ethical duty to look into, is this true? And, and if so, you know, I need to do something about it. So I reached out to my lawyer. I, I first, I reached out directly to the person that was being accused. And I said, what is going on? He went into this long rant about how somebody got into his iCloud account, leaked his news everywhere. And I didn't have, so the point is I never leaked nudes. I didn't send nudes to anybody. I alerted. You just wanted, you just wanted to know like, Hey, is this guy sending pics to 14 year olds? Because that's not somebody you'd want to represent. That's you'd want to get the hell out of. That, Absolutely. Right? And yeah, I mean, forget about the liability. I, I really was concerned. I mean, cause I had another house full of other teenage girls and you know, later come to find out this guy had an only fans. I mean, he's just, he really isn't somebody I would have wanted to work with. Um, and I wasn't, no, I mean, in, yeah. <laughs> you know, if I was bringing somebody on the channel on a regular basis and I mean, discovered that they were like sending pics to 14 year olds, I would cut ties. I mean, I, you know, I've talked about this before, but like we used to have a guy, uh, who we did, um, like, uh, you know, the sequence of sort of uh, what are you, trials of the century with. And he turned out to be a pretty toxic individual. And so we cut him, right? Like, that's yeah. just how you do this thing, right? So yeah, I thought it was like being professional. And the sad thing was that in the article, it, um, Taylor wrote it to make it seem as though like I was some kind of like a pervert that was doing it for revenge because he was trying to leave my talent agency. And and by the way, guys, like if, if you, so if, uh, I don't know about in Canada, but if you live in the United States and, um, you sign a management agreement with somebody, that's not like a slavery agreement. Okay. Like if you don't want to work for them anymore, you can leave and go do whatever you want. Now, if you signed like a thing that says you owe them 20%, then you maybe can go on and, and, and do whatever you want, but they could sue you for that 20% for as long as a contract was standing. So like, right. for example, you know, if, if a creator didn't want to be with me anymore, I would be like, well, okay, I, I don't have any, it doesn't, it's not going to cost me any extra work. I, I might want to go and get my money for the, the deals I helped you get for a year or whatever, however long the contract was. But anyway, to ruin this guy or to, you know, talk badly about him, to leak photos publicly or whatever, it wouldn't have done me any good. I, I'm, I just don't really understand why that was even in there. But anyway, she made it seem like I was leaking them publicly. And so and she had done all this back and forth before she published saying like, um, nobody's alleging that Ari leaked nudes. So I didn't talk to her. I, I had my attorney talk to her. And, um, you know, 
on my Twitter page, you guys can watch. There's like a little segment that um, this this YouTuber did that was actually pretty spot on about the whole like my side of the story. But this happened in 2020 and it got me like super interested in the legal community. I think um, I mean, obviously, I watched the Johnny Depp trial because I was super interested in defamation. Like I'm I'm like what one of the people that's anybody that's here watching. I was one of you guys who basically was like, wow, this thing happened to me. What's my resource so that I can learn anything about what to do to help myself, right? So then I went and started watching um, basically all people like Runkle. And um, and I read, uh, I don't think I ever finished it, but I did read um, the book about the Hulk Hogan lawsuit that was funded by a billionaire. That's a really cool story if you guys don't know that one. But that got kind so of, yeah. It just sounds like at the end of the day, I mean, I'm guessing that the money of New York Times was kind of a an, in, an unstoppable obstacle. Well, so this is basically what happened. So Taylor in 2020 um, was pretty powerful. She was like Forbes 40 under 40. She was like in all yeah. these. And so she would write about tech companies and she would a lot of times attack tech founders Um multiple people, not just myself. Um, and then her articles would cause those people's businesses to, you know, um, either close or they would fire, you know, the CEO or whatever. But so she had a lot of power if she wrote an article about you. Since 2020, when she wrote the article about me, which, you know, ultimately, I think the biggest thing is that if you have a bad article written about you in your business and you're working with big brands like I was like L'Oreal and Universal Music Group and Chipotle, they get they get nervous. They they actually have uh, internal systems. Um, they're like platforms kind of uh, where they basically will run a name. And if you are a red flag in their system, which even if you have one article from eight years ago, and you are flagged, they won't work with you. I know that because a lot of influencers that I would submit, they'd be like, oh, we can't work with that one because we ran her through the system and she got flagged. So I knew immediately that when the article was out that, you know, I lost my business. And I had, you know, people in, in my clients, you know, my, my client from L'Oreal was like, Ari, I love you, but like you got to figure out a way to publicly like vindicate yourself. And so that's what... Uh, initially got me interested in suing but but here's the thing since 2020 taylor lorenz has sort of self-owned herself in a way that i couldn't have even done if i wanted to do it to her um you know and and here's the other thing guys like i i'm a like i was apolitical when all this stuff happened but i realized kind of the politics of the media and and the new york times is sort of a, a liberal um uh news organization and so when i wanted to go get my side of the story told a lot of other liberal news organizations were like well we don't really want to go against the new york times right or they were like well i'm also represented by uta so i don't want to go up against my agency so then i'm like so who's going to support me or, you know, tell my side? And um, and so then you kind of realize like an enemy of my enemy is my friend. Right. So I thought maybe uh, once I got the lawyers on contingency, you still have to pay for legal expenses. Right. So you have to pay for the deposition costs and um, legal and pay experts. for all of the. Uh, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, it sounds like the win here is you made it out having sort of got that vindication at the. Right. Uh, you know, at the motion to dismiss stage, we, that that was and the big it's win. Just, it's just too yeah. much, too much money to to see it through to well, the end. Yeah, and so in the beginning, I had um, a lot of wealthy. Um, well, I think I had a, a, a few uh, wealthy tech uh, investors that really disliked uh, Lorenz and sort of what journalists like her stand for, and who were willing to fund um, the lawsuit. But they wanted, I think, they wanted to wait until it got past the motion to dismiss. So they were into it, you know, in 2020 and then or 2021. And then by 2023, it's like they just those types of people don't I, I don't think they have the same, you know, uh, excitement for funding the lawsuit, which actually is a, it's a little bit of a bummer because last night after I announced or I think whatever day I announced the lawsuit was being closed, um, I actually got a text that said, hey, did you close it with um uh, prejudice because I, I got I'm sitting here having smoking cigars with 
two guys that want to fund it from Texas. I'm like, and it is, it is done with prejudice. So yeah. yeah. Um, Well, but yeah. So, and the way it works is just that they actually did have to uh, agree to dismiss it. So uh, I don't have to, I don't owe them any legal fees. Um, And to be honest with you, I just like, I didn't want to be having this over my head for the next four years. Like I want to be a content creator. I want to tell my story. I'll probably write a book. There's people interested in the documentary just about like how crazy it is, like a kind of cancel culture, but also understanding just the defamation and how things work. So, yeah. I'm going to say there's a lot more to this that I'd really like to determine. So at some point we got to like, yeah, I'd love to do a a follow up. And but, um, I'm going to catch the rest of your arrest stuff because I, I find it very interesting as well. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me. I, I kind of wanted to talk about it while it's still fresh, but we we should go into depth at some point soon. Yeah, well, um, it's so nice to, to meet you on stream and, and hopefully in Vegas when you come out here. And, and thanks for the people that don't know me and let me cut in here. But uh, it was fresh news and, and Runkle was kind of like the only one that covered the uh, the motion uh, to dismiss that I beat. Um, and so, uh, he covered it so recently that, that I, I, I wanted to come on and say hi. So, um, thank well, you. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, next time in, I'm in Vegas, we'll, I'll definitely, yeah, absolutely. Up and we'll, uh, we'll chat. <laughs> so, all right. Talk all right. to you soon. And, bye. Uh, <laughs> bye. All right. So thank you uh, once again to to Taylor or to Ari Jacob. My brain is uh, a little fried. To Ari Jacob for the update here. We're gonna get back to the uh, the witness here, and um, yeah, it is. It's gonna be interesting. So here we are gonna skip past. Um, they've got a fairly lengthy sidebar as they argue about this guy whether or not he's an armor. I will I'll try. Oh. I am being told that I forgot to set the audio back. Elaine, your mic. Your mic. A lot of times what they'll attach to that email are um, the sides, the actual parts of the script we're shooting for the day, and then safety bulletins, whatever union um, safety bulletins would be appropriate for that day, whether firearms or animals, uh, inclement weather. Um, And then on the day of filming, uh, typically the first assistant director would call for um, a safety meeting and call. So what they're talking about here, this is important, although boring. Um, Safety meetings. On a film set, you will have uh, safety meetings everywhere. And for just about everything, you're going to be seeing safety meetings or safety briefings. And so safety briefings are going to be things like, um, you know, as he said, like inclement weather. Hey, it might be really cold out or it might be really hot out. And if it's really hot out, you know, it's like you need to make sure you're hydrating. If it's really cold out, it's like, please dress appropriately. Um, In uh, what's that film? The um, uh, Passion of the Christ. Um, What is it? Cavizial was struck by lightning. Hopefully there was something in the safety briefings about like lightning is a risk. Um, But, you know, it might be something like we're going to be on horses. You know what's really dangerous on a film set? A freaking horse. Because a horse is a whole lot of muscle um, that just that somehow humanity has managed to convince we're in charge. Um, But... If a horse decides you're not in charge anymore, the horse has a lot of power to emphasize that you're not in charge. Like, for instance, if a horse kicks you in the teeth, 
you don't have teeth anymore. Um, if if a horse decides it wants to throw you, you're on the dirt. Um, so, like, these things go into safety briefings. Like, hey, we got a horse. Um, mind the horse. Like, these kinds of things. And if you've got guns on a set, obviously the guns need to go into the safety briefing. Right? And you got to actually have safety briefings. So... Um, and we're also going to hear one of the first references to All another dude. All the cast and crew that would be involved to listen to that meeting. And potentially the armor may have something to say uh, as far as um, what we're doing. If we're firing blanks, here's the... But hang on, I'm going to stop you right there. Um, so, hypothetically, if, this, if the scene calls for the firing of blanks, because we haven't had a lot of this testimony in trial mm -hmm. yet... Mm -hmm. Can you explain to the jurors what your understanding is about uh, the difference in the different loads of blanks? Uh, in my experience, the, uh, the armor would tell us if we're using dummies or blanks, and if we're using blanks, which would make a noise and a flash, they would typically describe the power. Um, quarter load, half load, full load would give us some indication as to uh, the potential uh, danger with that particular um, firearm being used by the actor in that scene. And let so let's talk about what it means for a blank to be quarter load, half load, full load. Um, the, the, like each projectile, like each cartridge has an expected amount of powder. And so a quarter load, and guys, I know that this is going to sound dirty. Once again, we're going to sound like the most boring orgy going on. But uh, a full load is exactly as much powder as would normally be found in the cartridge. You know, a half load is half of that. Quarter load is quarter of that. And so you're going to get different... The reason why you might use different things is that a full load is going to make a bigger noise and more muzzle flash than, uh, than a quarter load will. So a quarter load might be used if you've got people who are, for instance, close to the, um, you know, close to the... Uh, uh, you know, the, to the firing, right? And so if you've got somebody who is, you know, you're going to fire the gun and it's going to go off three feet from another dude's head, you're probably using a quarter load so it's much quieter. And so at that point, you're like, okay, um, you know, that's, um, that's not so loud. It's not going to cause damage. Everyone's wearing hearing protection and you're picking your angles so you can't see the hearing protection. But, um, you know, that's, a, but there's some scenes where you might want the, you know, the bigger, louder thing. Specifically, like if you've watched something like Equilibrium, where you can see the really cool fight scenes that happen in the dark, where it's illuminated by gunfire. This is also something that you'll see in some of the John Wick movies. Those are done with full load. Um, so, yeah. Let me, let me stop you right there. You talked about the particular danger. Um, can blanks be dangerous on a movie set? My understanding is they can, yes. Blanks, he's 100% right here. Blanks absolutely can be dangerous. For instance, if I pick up a gun and put it to my skull and fire it with a blank, I am done. Um, that... I get a timeout from being alive, and that timeout is forever. Um, you can get killed by a blank, 100%. So um, you got to be careful with blanks. Uh, there is a guy who actually was killed because he was messing around and put up a blank to his head and fired, and that was, that was the end of him. Uh, yeah, Mr. Hexum. So... Yeah, do not pass go or do not pass go, do not collect two hundred dollars. And 
are there certain um judges is, is being very permissive safety gear uh that some crew members may use <laughs> if there is going to be the firing of blanks in their uh immediate proximity yes and can you explain to the to, to the jurors uh what that would be in your experience certainly um uh, the very basic um personal protective equipment we would use would at the very least be safety glasses and some form of hearing protection hearing protection this guy is being allowed to testify to a whole lot of shit that i would not let him testify about um i mean he can say like on previous sets i've worn this but he's basically testifying about him being an ex like he's He's being an expert on this. Pardon me. Um, but sometimes it may be uh, covering the camera operators that may be in jeopardy with special coats um, to deflect anything coming out of those firearms. We may protect the camera and the lens with uh, special acrylics like Lexan, bulletproof glass, essentially. So. Uh, by the way, I do like airsoft stuff. I've put Lexan over like, you know, um, you know, over, for instance, like a, uh, a scope, that kind of thing. So I see people saying he's been on th movie sets for 30 years. He's not. The thing is, is you're not an expert unless you're qualified as an expert. Like you could be John Moses Browning himself. And if you don't know who John Moses Browning is, he is like gun Jesus. Um, you could be John Moses Browning himself, and unless you have been qualified by the court as an expert, you don't get to be an expert. So, yeah. Um, yes, we would take certain precautions. Is that the reason that it's important for you to know what size blank is going to be used? Yes. And... With regard to dummies, go, go ahead and, and continue to kind of walk us through how this would work. So, uh, typically, uh, depending on the firearms um, being Ian used McCollum in this case, not, it was a Western. It's not John Moses so Brown. I like Ian McCollum, but he's not John Moses Brown. Firearms were older Western style um, six guns where you would see if the gun was potentially loaded or not. Um, and sometimes that may simply mean loaded with a dummy round. Lexan so is perfectly good saw, for like bits uh, of the front crap. of the firearm. Guys, um, the knock off the would think that it was absolutely a loaded. Knock off the whole trans debate in the chat, guys. It really isn't. This isn't the right place. And yeah, um, and Second Amendment for everybody firearm but um, the dummy rounds typically for us as the crew um, are, are different than the blanks in that they may appear as though they're a, a real um, bullet but they would typically have a hole drilled in them or the primer this is a fair the comment that would ignite that bullet would be removed or already be uh, pushed in um, and then sometimes the dummies, uh, depending on how they're being used in the film, you can't make holes in them. So what the, uh, I guess the props people that make them put a little BB in there. So the armor can shake that dummy and you would hear a little BB rattle in there. And this guy is getting way beyond his expertise, right? Um, and the defense is going to be upset by this. And this is something that happens to defense lawyers all the time. we got to deal with witnesses who are testifying to stuff that is beyond their expertise there. How frequently did safety now, meetings Now, he's going to say occur? something that is... I don't know that I was invited to more than one during our couple This of is weeks relevant. This is something he can testify so to. So for the one entire safety two meeting. weeks, you only were... You are only aware of one safety meeting. That's my recollection, yes. Okay, so we've talked about safety bulletins and safety meetings.
go ahead and continue to walk us through, um, in your experience, the protocol of an armor with firearms. Um, in my experience, the, the armors are usually the, uh, well, for lack of a better description, the most um, uptight and anal retentive people on set because they literally have people's lives in their hands. I'm going to go through this again. Um, in your experience, guys, the listen to this. This is important. With firearms. Um, in my experience, the the armors are usually the, uh, well, for lack of a better description, the most um, uptight and anal retentive people on set because they literally have people's lives in their hands. Um, they don't joke around. They don't really have friendly conversations. They stick to themselves and... Um, focus on the task at hand. Um, most of them, in my experience, seem to be either former military or law enforcement and have some sort of background with firearms. Um, the armor is usually the asshole on set. Why is defense not objecting? Because he will be able to, like, this is just his experience. But... Um, the armor is usually the asshole on set. There are certain jobs you need to be an asshole to do. Um, and armor is kind of one of them. And I don't mean that you got to be an asshole in the sense of like, you know, like aggressive or whatever else. You've got to be willing to be the person who says, fuck you, no. And... You have to be willing to be the person who just says, I don't care what this, like, I, I've i called a bunch of, um, I've called a bunch of armors to talk about this trial. And what they've said is that sometimes their job is to be like, listen, I don't care that it's costing you millions of dollars a day to not film we are doing this right or we're not doing it at all lawyers are often called the fun police we're often like i get so many people who are like hey can i do this and i'm like hey no you fucking can't because you will go to jail or you will all sorts of things you have to be the person to say, God, no, you sh cannot do this, right? You can't do this. I know you want to play with the guns. You can't. You know, that's the armorer's job. Um, the lawyer's job is like, I know you have this brilliant idea for a business. You can't do it because that's against the law. Um, somebody else in chat had a comment about, um, being cybersecurity. It's like, I know you have, I know it's more expensive, but we really do need a firewall. You know, all of these things, right? Your job as the armor is to say, no, you can't do that. And if you can't do that, if you can't take that, if you can't take that role on, you need to not be an armorer, right? You need to not be uh, the armorer if you can't do that. Defense is going to say, oh, she's a woman and she's 24. And I know some of you are going to be like, Runkle, fuck you. Women are every bit as, you know, capable. This is the defense's argument that I'm mocking here. They're going to say, oh, she's just a woman. She's, you know, just 24. She can't do that. And... I'm going to tell you, if you can't do it for any reason, you need to not take the job. And I will tell you that some of the, like, the young female lawyers I encounter are absolute fucking badasses. I have watched a 21-year-old lawyer, female lawyer, destroy a cop who'd been at the job for like 20 years 
almost longer than she had been alive, destroyed a cop on cross-examination. She stared this cop in the eye and took him apart. You're telling me she couldn't do that? You're telling me? And somebody says 21 years old and a lawyer? Yeah, because she skipped the undergrad part. And the reason why she was able to skip the undergrad part is she's freaking good. Um, there's lots of, like, this whole argument of, oh, she's just, you know, whatever. It's like, oh, she's just taking a job that she can't be qualified for. How can you be a 21-year-old lawyer? Um, you, you go at, like, this is people who've skipped years. This is people who have, yeah. So... Uh, normally, you need an undergrad to get into law school, but if you have enough achievements, you can skip that. You can get into law school directly there. Am I tipsy? A little bit. Um, I. Ugh. Did you notice a, a difference then generally in terms of just the um, behavior, the general behavior? on the movie set of the other armors you worked with as compared to Ms. Gutierrez? Uh, yes. What was that? Um, she wasn't necessarily as uh, serious or professional as I'm hey, accustomed to with the other armors that I've worked with. What do you mean? Give us an example. Um, I recall walking by her uh, cart. And this is the thing, is that everyone else who told, who they went to, to say, like, you get eight hours, or eight days of armor work, and then, like, you're going to have to split between armor and props person. Everyone else they told, like, every other armor they went to said, go to hell. You don't get to, like, we're not doing this. She's the one who agreed to cut the corners. And it got somebody killed. A number of times and firearms and or uh, bandoliers or ammo belts being left out on the cart uh, unsecured. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen an armor pull loose ammo out of a fanny pack. Typically, my experience with armors is um, any ammo they use Blanks or dummies comes out of some sort of container, whether it's a labeled box or um, some other plastic type ammo container. So, I just want you to watch her eyes. Watch her eyes at this moment. Just type ammo container. So, <laughs> do you see the eye narrow? I got, I got the pause. I got the pause on this one. Do you see her narrowing her eyes? She freaking hates his ass here. She hates his ass. Hates him. That, yeah. Um, she now, lets it slip for just a moment, you, but you we caught it. You that you would see uh, firearms and gun belts unattended on the cart. Um, why was that, why did that stand out to you? It, it was out of the ordinary. Um, again, my experience is, is most of the firearms I've seen on set come out of some sort of locked bag, locked container. Um, the armor, some armors, depending on the show, have a whole uh, wheel around cart with drawers that they can lock. Uh, a drawer that potentially has the individual's actor's uh, or character's name on that drawer um, so that character's props would live in that drawer under lock and key. And I got to say, if I was doing film armor stuff, um, I would absolutely have everything locked up. I don't trust actors. I don't trust, you know, like Alec Baldwin might be making millions of dollars a year. I don't trust him with with that right i don't trust any of this so yeah were the guns and gun belts laying out unattended on the prop cart was that a safety concern for you yes why 
uh, this guy was not one of the guys who inappropriate walked. and out of the ordinary um, that those firearms weren't secured and why is it concerning that the firearms aren't secured um, well I don't know that they're completely Alec wasn't the gonna play control if they're not they might have offered him key. one but he's not gonna take it and what's your understanding of whether those firearms that you saw unattended were they fake guns or were they real guns um, my understanding uh, most of the prop firearms we had on rust were actual um, working firearms which is the most common thing, right? You actually do want actual, like most film armoring is done with actual working firearms. So we're going to skip ahead to um, where things start getting really what the F. Do you recall um, being present on the set of Rust on a day where there were what I'm going to refer to as accidental discharges of guns. Yes. Um, can you describe the first accidental discharge that you recall happening? Um, I think the first one was the um, I don't know if the prop master was loading or unloading. And let me stop you. What's the prop master's name? Um, Sarah, I think her name was Sarah Zachary. I think okay. That was her name. Um, she was, we were, we were outside of the character Rust's cabin. And I don't know if she was loading or unloading a handgun, but... Um, unannounced to any of the crew that firearm discharged so we consider that i'm just gonna say sarah zachary had no business unloading a gun who should be unloading a gun only one person hannah if other people are touching the guns this is a major major problem major problem and the thing is is if you have the average number of accidental discharges on a movie set is zero, which is the appropriate number. That's the appropriate number is zero. The fact that they were having not one, but two negligent discharges on this set is insane. Insane. Uh, negligent discharge. And how did you know it discharged? I was within feet of it, and she seemed pretty spooked when I turned around, and it appeared as though she had um, shot that firearm at her foot. Can you tell us in your in your experience? She should not have been opinion, loading that gun. What she shouldn't have been that touching gun was it. Loaded with. I. It, it made a bang. But it didn't, you know, I don't know if there was a bullet or not, because I don't know if it hit her foot. Um, but it certainly made a loud noise that spooked us and the animals we had on set. I think we had a couple of horses on set. And, uh, and again, it was unannounced. So it was a surprise to everybody that was around. Were you preparing to film a, a scene That's or fair. a take you at can that time? have some doubt about this guy. Um, yes. Um, was it announced by anyone whether the guns were going to be loaded with dummies or blanks? I don't think at that moment it had been, no. Okay. Um, the... I believe she's got uh, immunity through a deal with the prosecution, so... So, when that accidental discharge happened, I mean, what did it sound like? Uh, a gun going off. Okay. And you indicated that this accidental discharge occurred because that gun was night, being Patty. loaded or unloaded by the prop master, Sarah Zachary. Is that right? That's correct. In she should never have been loading a gun. It's insane. On other movie sets with armorers, did you ever see the prop master loading and unloading the guns? 
I've never seen that, no. And can you describe what the other accidental discharge was that happened? Um, so like I had stated, we were uh, kind of outside the cabin we were using as Harlan Rust's uh, cabin. And I'm going to stop you real quick. Uh, who's Harlan Rust? Um, Harlan Rust is the lead character um, in the movie, and that was played Thank by Thank you for joining uh, us, uh, Ari. Okay, please continue. And uh, Little um, Miss Jacob on, uh, on um, Twitter. I believe it was um, Alec's uh, stunt double, so somebody dressed up to look like Alec, um, was going to be firing either some sort of long gun. I don't remember if it was a lever action gun or a shotgun, something out of uh, the window of the can, uh, cabin towards, um, I, I think it was the law enforcement that were chasing him, that were starting to catch up with him. There was supposed to be a gun, uh, some gunfire, and um, I believe that um, uh, uh, Hannah was prepping the stunt double in the cabin with that firearm, and uh, again, unannounced to any of us outside the cabin, um, that firearm was discharged. And what did it sound like? Uh, a loud um, gun going off. So, um, I, this guy is now testifying that Hannah had an accidental discharge herself. Um, you should not be having an accidental discharge as the freaking armor. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh. Um, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. All right, let's jump ahead a bit here um, to get a little bit more of the uh, spice. Mr. Audiag... Oh. Mr. Audiego, I think that when we broke, we, we, you had just finished describing uh, the accidental discharges to us. In your experience in the film industry and your opinion, who is responsible for accidental discharges on a movie set? Your Honor, I'm going to object again. His opinion is he's not an expert. He has no idea, and we don't even know what set being talked about. That's a big speaking objection. Uh, the reason why you don't allow speaking objections is that the jury hears all this, right? So, being tendered as an expert. And now we get back to more of this. Who's responsible? Um, member of the crew yes the uh, the discharges were only an hour apart an accidental discharge uh they might be i thought he said hannah there but the i could be wrong i'll have to go back right. so who's responsible he was Did allowed to answer that the discharges armor. that you described cause um, you yes typically yep yeah. yes did you articulate that concern to anyone on set i did who um both the um, first ad and his uh, second in command on set, the second second AD. And when you say the first AD, Thank you, who Daily are you Watcher. referring to? Um, Dave Halls. And what did you say to Mr. Halls? Uh, I don't recall my exact uh, words said to Hannah Mr. For the Hall, second. but Good. I expressed okay, I was my, right there. I thought um, said. I thought he said Hannah. Frustration and anger with the fact that uh, safety seemed to be secondary to um, the production clock. And without saying what Mr. Halls said, um, was Mr. Halls responsive to your concerns? Mr. Halls ignored me and walked away. Without saying what he said, because, uh, because that would be hearsay, so. And what did you do then? I went to his um, uh, second 
second second um, uh, Anne, I don't recall Anne's last name, and express my anger and frustration and and uh, ask that this put be put on the production report. So what's a production report? Um, the production report is uh, essentially the diary of everything that happens um, throughout production on the film set. Do you know whether or not this was ever included in the production report? I do not. Thank you. And then what happens? What happens? Because it's big. Why did Hannah remove the lawyer? We don't know. Um, we don't know. The morning of October 21st, 2021. Were you working on set that day? I was. And approximately what time do you think you arrived on set? Pretty early. I believe our call was between 6 a.m. and 7 a.m. that day. And what does that mean, your call? Um, uh, my, so on that call sheet we've discussed, um, those emails would tell me specifically um, what time my department uh, required for the day. But what was that? The uh, camera department had decided to uh, leave the show due to um, safety concerns and some other concerns they had. So the entire camera department walks off the set. The entire camera department walks off due to safety concerns, although on cross he's going to admit that there's some other issues as well. Um, but we're also going to hear that the replacements are... Um, she's never going to be in yeah, armor again. Rushed she's she's done. Gun she's not going to be allowed on a film set involved. again. Is there a saying in the film industry? Uh, Even if she's acquitted, something about making your day. Yes. What does it mean in the film industry to make your day? Um, so if we know that on that call sheet we've been given that there are, for example, four scenes, and productions budgeted twelve hours to to complete that work in a day. Um, if we complete that, we've made our day. Otherwise, we've got a we production has to figure out where else um, to schedule that work. Making your day. So this is uh, number of days, whatever it be to me. Uh, uh, okay, so you didn't have enough time. In a nutshell, we were we certainly didn't have enough time to yep. do what was being asked. So you indicated that the camera crew walking off created more of a chaotic environment. Can, can you give the jurors a little bit more of a description about how not having them there was affecting things? And were they replaced? Um, well, yes, they were replaced. Um, it, it, so on a, well, on most projects. I don't think she'd be allowed to do craft services on a fast. film set again. Uh, um, we all count on each other and, and um, become close in that short amount of time. And um, and craft services so are the like camera the people department who bring out the sandwiches counted on me and, and I counted on them and, and knew that I could trust them. And, um, and Helena had handpicked us all to make up her crew. Um, so when suddenly, uh, you know, I think it was roughly six people of that crew decided to leave. Um, that was certainly a, a disruptive thing. And um, I think we soon learned that their replacements um, weren't, certainly weren't as qualified as they were. And also they only replaced one, uh, one of the camera teams. So it also meant to me that um, this schedule is going to get much more intense because we now summary um they they replaced them with a sketchier crew you know the crew was now sketch and there's half as many um so we're gonna jump ahead a little bit here uh he's going to mention 
what Baldwin is up to. Okay, I apologize for that. Um, the scene that was being filmed prior to the lunch hour that we're working up this to show. normal speed. We're going to pick um, it up to one and a half. Describe what this scene was supposed to be. What was your understanding of what was going to be filmed? Um, that uh, Harlan Rust um, was going to be laying away in this church for the lawmen that he knew were pursuing him and um, spoilers, by the, the way, for catching up to the him. movie Rust. I'm sorry. With regard to um, firearms, uh, was it your what was your understanding about what, if any, firearms were going to be present and used during the filming of that scene? Um, what I understood was that we were going to uh, Dave Hall's finish the piece we started looking at, where it's the uh, um, Harlan Rust's reaction uh, to the lawmen coming in, and then um, we were going to film one more piece uh, that we re would refer to as an ECU, an extreme close-up, where you see Harlan Rust uh, contemplating pulling his gun or not, kind of rubbing his hands, and then he starts to draw the firearm. Uh, my understanding is once we had that piece filmed, we were going to do what we would call a turnaround. So we'd then be filming from behind um, uh, Harlan Rust, Alec Baldwin, um, seeing the, the, I think it was two lawmen come into the church and then the shootout would ensue from there. So during the scene in the morning, was Mr. Baldwin armed with his prop gun? Uh, yes. And what was your understanding about whether that was a real gun or a replica? meaning a rubber gun or a plastic gun? My understanding is Mr. Baldwin always wanted to use his, uh, what we refer to as his hero props. So I understood it to be a real uh, a cold gun at that point. And when you say cold gun, explain to the jurors what you mean. Um, cold gun would indicate that the um, armor and uh, potentially first ID had deemed that uh, weapon safe to be used on set. Uh, cold referring to the fact that um, the trigger could be pulled and nothing would happen. So... Baldwin insists that he has his gun on him because Baldwin likes this notion that he can just say, okay, let's roll now. Um, I think that most armors would have told him, no, you do not need the, the real gun. We can keep it nearby in a locked case, but you need to, like, this scene does not need a real gun, so you don't use one. You just use, like, you know, something else, you know. So, yeah. Did you know whether the gun in the morning was, um, whether it had dummies in it or whether it was just empty? I don't know. Okay. Um, so how did, did, did you see for the morning session who brought Mr. Baldwin the gun? I did not. And... How did that morning session inside the church go? Was it relatively uneventful? How was it? Uh, I mean, other than the previously stated uh, kind of state of rushed chaos we were in, I would say yes, mostly uneventful. And then when you had completed uh, those couple of takes that we're going to show here shortly, um, what happened then? Uh, we, I think that's when we broke for lunch for the day. And approximately how long was your uh, lunch? Um, I think we were doing half-hour lunches. Maybe they might have been a little longer because our where lunch was was a little bit of a van ride from where we were filming. And when you say a little bit of a van, van ride, how far away was, how was that set up? Um, I think that, uh, so the production clock for us works on six-tenths of an hour. So it may have been six minutes away. So if it was a half-hour lunch, it may have ended up being approximately 42 minutes. I mean, she um, should have said you know, no, but travel, she should have also not loaded the catering. And is the food just provided for you all right there on set? There's a caterer and a catering tent, yeah, if not on set, on the uh, facility where we were filming, yes. So approximately what time, if you know, would you have completed lunch and come back into the church to continue filming? Again, I, I think we started between 6 or 7, so lunch would have been called at 12 or 1 and 42 minutes after that. So I haven't eaten, sake, folks. I am two, starting two to feel hungry. So after you heard Ms. Gutierrez's Skipping voice, ahead a little you heard bit. Mr. Hall's uh, call out cold gun. Where was the gun the next time you saw it? in um, Mr. Bald uh, yeah, in Mr. Baldwin's um, holster uh, on his left side. Um, did you see Ms. Gutierrez in the church? I don't recall seeing her in the church after lunch, no. So go ahead and walk us through. Um, Mr. Baldwin now has the gun. Where is, he, where is he sitting? What is he doing? Take us through this. 
um, Mr. Baldwin seated in a church pew, and um, and uh, Reed and I are trying to find an angle, looking kind of over his um, his right elbow or right bicep to see his hands in his lap transition from his lap to uh, that firearm that's kind of hidden in a holster under the coat that he's wearing. Um, so if you can stand up, if you don't mind, and demonstrate what you believed Mr. Baldwin was I'm being told to I gotta eat for I'll the be right blocking. Back. So directly, if if I'm sitting in the pew as uh, Harlan Rust, um, Helena Hutchins did I cut off the mic? I did. Essentially, directly. In I'll. Uh, said cold gun. Did you describe that? Over I his, cut off the mic, um, didn't I? I'm his sorry, folks. right elbow or right bicep to see his hands in his lap transition from his lap to uh, that firearm that's kind of <laughs> hidden in a holster under the coat that he's wearing. Um, so if you can stand up, if you don't mind, and demonstrate what you believed Mr. Baldwin was supposed to do for the blocking. Um, I didn't have any snacks. My understanding was it was just to reveal uh, that Part of you know the part of the gun that holds the bullets um, coming out of the holster, and then that portion of the you know that piece of photography was finished. Once we saw that gun coming out of the holster, it would again give the audience uh, the idea and that story that um, that Harlan Rust is about to uh, defend himself or try to shoot the lawmen before they shoot him as they enter the church. How close were the cameras to Mr. Baldwin? Um, the only camera we had in the church was, um, I think at that point I was, had the lens. So guys, um, he is, um, what is it? He's not supposed to be pulling the whole gun out. So basically we have a, an account that Baldwin's got problems with his pullout game. Um. <laughs> All right. Um. Jump ahead a little bit here. It was uh, shoulder to shoulder, just to my right. He was looking at my uh, my dolly monitor, so he could see what the camera was seeing. So, why would the director be in the room? looking at your monitor well let me let, let me ask it this way would the director normally be looking at that vantage point through from, from video village um depends on the director and the situation sometimes they'll work with us more closely where they will be uh, shoulder to shoulder and we'll look at my monitor we were still waiting for the um, uh, the new camera assistants to finish converting from steady cam to what we call studio mode so I don't believe the camera actually had a monitor um, and potentially that's why he was looking over my shoulder instead of a bit removed in um, the video village Okay, we're going to pause for a moment. Mm -hmm. We think we're going to be able to watch these videos, and that's going to give everybody a much better idea of what was going on in there. All right, so they got some video to show us here. Hope springs eternal. 
And we're going to skip right. ahead to skip over their technical problems. I am now going to play what will be marked as State's Exhibit 112A. Um, I would ask the court to uh, go ahead and admit 112A and give permission to publish. <laughs> Suck it, movie uh, company. 112A is admitted. You may publish. We got the boom guy. Set, ready, and action. Ivan Rush. Did you stand up nice and slow? Tell us any weapons you have. That's Jensen Ackles, Again, by the way. Ready? Little too what? That's Jensen Ackles, you can and hear speaking to him. Set. I think we all like Jensen Ackles better than we like Russ. Alec Baldwin. Did you get up nice and slow? Talk to the weapons you have. One more. You good? Ready? Set. Ready and action. Arlen Russ. Did you get up nice and slow? Talk to the weapons you have. Jensen Ackles was in Supernatural, a uh, bunch of other things. Okay, which way? Camera right or left? So camera left for now. I'll stand right here for so, you. So whip it out. Yeah. Okay, well, let me get this all greased. Ready? Okay, ready? Okay, ready? So you heard that he's going to whip it out, but first he needs to get it all greased and ready. Um, fuck, I don't like hearing that from Alec Baldwin. Why is no armor armorer talking? Because she's not in the room. Ready. And set. Ready. And action. Island Russ. <laughs> now, did you see his finger on the trigger? Because his finger was real on the trigger. Now, guys, did you hear that? Did you hear that click? Listen for the click. You hear that click. I don't think that's the hammer falling. I think that's him pulling back the... Um, I think that's him pulling back the, uh, the hammer. Um, let's put that at one quarter speed we're watching this at one quarter speed yep Finger on the trigger, I hear a click. That's all sorts of ugly, folks, right there. Nice. Okay, uh, so the, the blocking, you can take these, thank you, Shad. Um, the blocking that you were describing, um, as a person who was working in the room, were you expecting this was before lunch, Mr. Baldwin, to pull the gun all the way out? 
like like what we just saw in those clips? Um, you can see his thumb pull the hammer in back. The blocking yep. of uh, the ECU. What's the ECU? Uh, extreme close up. Okay. I was not. Okay. My uh, under. Go ahead. My understanding was it was just to kind of reveal that weapon coming out of the holster to the camera. So I think that we may have uh, ended uh, your description of what was going on in the after lunch session uh, where Mr. Souza was standing. Um, and were there other people in the church also? Yes. Do you know approximately how many people were in there? Um, myself, Reed, the camera operator. Uh, Reed Zach, isn't Hannah. Uh, the boom Reed guy is a different. Was... When you say the boom guy, what is it? Uh, sorry, sorry, guys. Uh, sound, sound, the sound, um, uh, the person handing, uh, holding the um, sound boom. So recording sound for the sound mixer was in the church. Um, Joel was uh, shoulder to shoulder, like I had described, looking at my monitor. I uh, believe uh, Mamie Mitchell was to his right. Um, uh, wardrobe, uh, a woman named Doran was in there, I think, looking over Mimi's shoulder at the monitor. Um, Helena, Serge, um, my direct boss, uh, Reese Price, who's the key grip, he's the head of the grip department, um, had just come in uh, to work with Helena and Serge. Um, Dave Hall. That wasn't an actual take, that was still practice, I believe. Um, and maybe uh, one of the effects guys, I recall, uh, was kind of in and out, keeping an eye on things because they had, they had pre-rigged some of their effects stuff in the ceiling, uh, again, in preparation for the big turnaround that we were about to do. Okay. So I, don't, I, mean, I didn't give you a number, but I think that works out to 12-ish. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so... Keep walking us through it. What happens next? Um, so we, uh, I guess Reed and I are, are trying to find the camera angle that uh, Joel, the director, is is happy with that he feels will tell that piece of the story. Uh, We're going to skip ahead a little bit here. We each have a best boy and then the rest of their department. Um, and uh, my understanding was Matt had some combat medical training. Um, so he came in to assist the uh, this medic is after the shooting happened. And um, I think I, um, I... When... You can see him starting right to... The gun it's starting off. to hit him here, right? Um, do you the emotion is starting to well up in him. I do not. Um, and did Mr. Baldwin stay in the church? I, he sat down in that same pew, I think, in that moment when I yelled out that if you can't help us, you need to, you know, get out of here. I think he sat down, and then at some point, I know I, I looked over and he was gone. So okay. Now I can just say like. I have been in a lot of trials. I've seen a lot of witnesses break down, and I can hear it in his voice that it's happening, right? I can hear it that he's starting to get there. I can feel that starting to hit him. And in terms of your attention to Mr. Souza, um, what were you doing to him? Were you touching his body? What were you doing? I was, I was. So um, Joel was wearing a, kind of a, a you can hear it in his voice, hoodie, right? and I believe he had a t-shirt or a couple shirts on underneath. So it was start to uh, figure out where uh, Joel had been injured. He was certainly at that point um, writhing in pain and, and he's trying to keep it together. Uh, concerned for himself, asking me how Helena was and. And I think come into the realization that he had been shot. Um, so I was trying to find uh, where he was wounded. Um, so started he's, pulling back his hoodie here, to right? uh, reveal what 
appeared to be a circular wound in his right shoulder. And at that point, um, I think the, the sheriff and uh, Matt came in. Uh, they had gloved hands. I didn't, so I had some of his blood on my hands. And um, I think I helped them uh, roll Joel over. Um, one of them had uh, trauma shears to cut his shirt off. And then I helped roll him over, and I was in a position um, to see that uh, what appeared to be um, a bullet just under the skin, um, basically where his right shoulder blade was. Um, and he was in a great deal of pain. And um, I think that Cher gave me some gauze to just put some uh, pressure on the wound while they attended to um, Helena's injuries, which uh, I gathered at that you time. You can hear them breaking now. much more severe. You can hear it. Because of her. Uh, proximity to the firearm. And could you hear Ms. Hutchins? I, I know you indicated that Mr. Souza was um, kind of yelling out in pain. And you can see this sort of stare as he's like hanging on. Um, this is a guy right now who is trying to hold it together. Now, I don't want to go through all of his, um, I don't want to go through sort of all of this moment because he's sitting there like just trying to focus, right? He's just trying to hold it together. But I do want to talk a little bit about the, um, uh, about the gender disparity that applies to emotion in court. And that applies to especially men crying and men breaking down. Because I was in Court TV's chat. I was also in Emily's chat and Legal Vice's chat and Denny's chat, but especially Court TV's chat. And, you know, I'm. Uh, the one I saw it in, like I'm, I was in a bunch of chats, but the one I saw it in was especially Court TV's chat, where people were saying, "Oh, you know, this guy needs to toughen up. This guy needs to, you know, he's got to be faking it. Um, you know, he's got to be whatever." And I'm like, "You wouldn't say that about a woman. You wouldn't say that about anything, you know." And you know, sometimes dudes break down, right? Like, you know, people said this about Rittenhouse when Rittenhouse, uh, you know, broke down. People were like, oh, he's got to be faking it because a guy wouldn't cry. F that, right? I mean, it, it just happens. And, you know, you see cops break down. You see military guys break down. You see all sorts of people breaking down over this sort of thing, but because he's a dude, um, people, you know, and he's sitting there right now, um, he's sitting there thinking about, you know, how Helena Hutchins has died, and, you know, he's never going to get to talk to her again. He's never going to any of this. Um, it's, um, so, yeah, I, um, I thought that, you know, that needed to sort of be called out and spoken about because, um, yeah. So now let's go to Cross. Um, people are going to have some thoughts about the Cross. Um, when you started your testimony, I was listening to five different testimony, streams you talked today. about being on 12 prior movies with armor or something like that. Recall that? Yes. Yeah. And you talked about you're used to seeing ex-cops, ex-military, remember that? Yes. As the armor, the primary, were those all males? I can't give you a definitive on that. I think there may have been a female or two, female armor that I worked with in the past. But you just didn't, um, you weren't used to seeing a young 24-year-old armor, were you? A uh, female. I wasn't used to seeing a young 24-year-old armor 
and a female. That doesn't play into it for me, so. He's really trying to sell this um, to the jury. Whether male or female doesn't really matter in that case. Okay, and I want to get into another, and we'll work through these topics, but you've talked a lot about things that you think Miss Gutierrez-Reed did. One of the things you didn't tell the jury is that you've oh, sued they're definitely trying to make it a sexist, Alec Baldwin, haven't you? I have. You what? Yes. You, you have a pending lawsuit right now, don't you? Uh, as far as I know, it's pending, yes, sir. And your attorney's in the courtroom? He is indeed. Been watching your testimony? Clearly. See how you do? You'd have to ask him, sir. Okay. And you've sued Alec Baldwin and Russ Production? You'd have to ask him is legit, you know, is a legit answer there. But you have not sued Hannah Gutierrez Reed, have you? Again, you'd have to talk to my counsel about who I've actually sued. He's got no have money. Have you read the lawsuit? I perused it. You perused it? What does that mean? Did you read it? all the paragraphs or did you just read page one and just said knock yourself out lawyer go ahead um i think i got past page one but since i'm not in your industry i don't understand what a lot of that is and i trust my counsel to represent me it seems like so guys i'm just gonna say partially i think he is dodging these questions and this is part of why you get this out through your own like th on direct um but a lot of you know a lot of this is um uh being a defense lawyer sucks sometimes and People dislike defense lawyers because sometimes you have to go after a witness and sometimes you have to go after a sympathetic witness. It is the job of a defense lawyer. That said, if you don't like the defense lawyer at the end of it, then he's not doing his job great because he might be alienating you. That said, I have watched a lot of people who at the end of the day came away from this saying I don't like this witness because of the work the defense lawyer did which means that the defense lawyer did a decent job the jury is going to be arguing in the jury room about this witness and that is because the defense lawyer did his job it is ugly there are questions I think are greasy there are questions I think Think or there's places I think he got inappropriate, but he, you know, this is what he's got to do. Um, this is what he's got to do. I didn't like the defense lawyer. I thought um, I was more sympathetic to the witness after the cross, but a lot of people at the end of it did have their minds changed. So this is this is what defense lawyering is sometimes and I now the one thing I will further note here is the defense lawyer comes in hot. This is a hot cross, right? Um the defense lawyer comes in and he is like this whole lawsuit thing is hot cross, right? He is coming in sharp and then he tries to get softer to the witness and you can't do that you have to you know if you want to start soft you can start soft but once you go hot with a witness you are you're that's the footing you're on once you piss off the witness you are you know that's the footing you're on you can't get the witness back you're making a lot of opinions earlier on what armors do. You filed a lawsuit. Um, it seems like you, you could have read your lawsuit, right? Is there an objection relevance to whether or not he read his lawsuit? Well, I want to ask if he's, he's read these paragraphs because he has a totally different story in his lawsuit than he did today. That is one hell of a speaking objection, right? That is one hell of a speaking objection. That should have been, can we approach? 
that he wanted to put in front of the jury. And there's a lot of places where he is dropping stuff on the jury um, that, yeah. So I want to ask him if he's read and adopted this, this lawsuit. And I think he's already answered that. Did you approve your lawsuit being filed? I must have. Because it was filed. Right? Okay. And, and in that lawsuit, you're suing for a variety of things, punitive damages, right? Again, I'm not a lawyer, sir, so you'd have to discuss that with my counsel. Well, you know you're suing for loss of enjoyment of life. Certainly. Right? Okay. So here's the thing about lawsuits is that the only thing the court can give you is money in like 99.9% .9 of the time. Now, this guy is upset. This guy is like, this guy is, he doesn't like the defense lawyer. And because of that, he's dodging the questions. He should say, yes, I'm suing for punitive damages. Yes, I'm suing for these things. Because that's what a lawsuit is. He's trying to avoid that because he knows where the defense lawyer is going. But the defense lawyer is asking a sort of, you know, a sort of sketchy question, but he's allowed to do it. And you know you're suing for medical expenses and non-medical expenses, right? I understood that to be the case, yes. So out of this tragedy, you claim that you have a blast injury, right? I believe that's in the documents you're referring to, yes, sir. Did you go to the doctor for a blast injury? Um, I have talked to my physician about what happened that day, yes. You've talked to your physician. What, did they do any tests? Did they take any x-rays? Did you just tell him I was in this? And I, what? I described the incident and he did what he felt was appropriate. What was that? I'm not going to discuss my medical treatment with you, sir. Okay. Well, the thing is, is the witness is fighting back and how you feel about this witness and how you feel about this is really a litmus test for how you feel about the case. This is one of those witnesses that is kind of a break point in that if you were already feeling like Hannah Gutierrez is innocent, you are likely to side with the lawyer. If you are already feeling like Hannah Gutierrez is towards guilt, you are probably more likely to side with the witness. I side with this witness. Um, but, I mean, the lawyer has to try to get... The lawyer has to try to get a big win on this witness. And what I mean by that is he can't just poke this guy a little bit. He's got to really try to crush this witness. Because this witness is terrible for the defense lawyer. And... It's tough. This guy's a sympathetic witness. You can't come after a sympathetic witness without pissing a lot of people off. So, yeah. So you're, in any event, you're suing. Uh, I don't like the defense ball. lawyer here. Right? Yes. And, and you're here telling this jury all about Miss Gutierrez-Reed, but in your lawsuit, you talk about defendants. Rest now, I just want you to take note, like, you can see that this guy's position has changed, uh, like how he looks. Um, his eyes, you know, look at his eyes, look at his lips, look at that sort of expression. This guy is, you know, he's, he's cagey, like he's not wanting to answer things. But this is, I think, in part because he hates this lawyer. And I want you to think about how this feels, right? He is sitting here in a moment where he's just shown some serious vulnerability, right? He's shown some, um, you know, some emotion. Um, he's broken down. It's hard for guys to break down. And then you've got this lawyer who is throwing shit in his face. This guy hates the defense lawyer. Hates the defense lawyer. And so a lot of his pushing back and his caginess is he fucking hates the defense lawyer. Being cross-examined sucks. 
And one of the things I tell young lawyers is one of the things you will learn is you will um, you'll learn cross-examination skills. And you also, the most important thing about cross-examination skills is not to use them on your spouse. I have like once or twice been in an argument with my wife and felt myself setting up a cross-examination and I say, whoa, I'm about to do something that I can't take back. Let's take a... Let's take a 10 minute break. Let's take a little relax. We'll come back. We'll discuss this. But I cannot do this because if you get cross examining your wife, you're done. So, you, you know, cross examination sucks. Um, Production Alec Baldwin cut corners and cut costs and then endangered the cast and crew. So you believe that, right? Rust production? I do. And you believe that that their hiring of Gabrielle Pickle and Ro Walters to manage the budget was not a good idea because they uh, have cost-cutting problems on prior sets? You believe that? Correct. Okay. And you also believe that David Halls had prior safety issues, correct? Uh, yes. Uh, on a prior set, he didn't manage that safely, did he? That was my... Look at his face. You will never get this witness back. You have thrown shit in this guy's face. When he later tries to come back and to play soft with this witness, you cannot get that back. You cannot back this guy away from this expression. Ten years down the road, if this guy runs into Mr. Bowles on the street, he will glare at him. I have run into witnesses I have cross-examined and had them just, like, glare at you. You know, so, yeah. Understanding. Okay. You also believe, you, you knew that Ms. Gutierrez-Reed had asked for more training days as an armor. You knew that. I don't... In the form of question, there needs to be a question. It sounds like a statement. Were, you, you were over overruled. Okay. You're aware that Miss Gutierrez Reed asked Gabrielle Pickle for more time as an armor, more training days and more armor days. You're aware of that? I became aware of that after two people were shot. Yes, sir. Okay, well we you were it's in your That's the kind of that's the kind of answer that a pissed off witness will give you. Your lawsuit. It's part of your lawsuit. Uh, okay. Okay. So let me ask you this. Are you hoping that you can come in and testify here today and something happens to Ms. Gutierrez Reed and you can, it'll help your lawsuit? I'm hoping for justice, sir. For Two yourself. people were injured on a film set. That was a greasy as fuck question. Greasy question, but you have to ask it as the defense lawyer. It's a gr I hated that question. But I probably would have asked it too. Something happens to Ms. Gutierrez Reed and you can, it'll help your lawsuit? I'm hoping for justice, sir. For Two yourself. people were injured on a film set. That has not only affected me, that has affected the film industry. And you want money for that? I want justice. You In want what money? Your, your lawsuit didn't say justice, it says money. Again, says you'd have you can't put justice in the statement of claim. You can't put justice. Like, that's not, that's not something money. that's available. Is that, isn't that correct? Mr. Bowles needs to let the witness answer the question. That he's being argumentative. This needs to be a cross. I, I'll let him answer. I, I agree. You're suing for money. I asked my lawyer to help bring justice in this case. And if that doesn't mean criminal, then I would assume that means some sort of monetary justice. Yes. Okay. Now, you also he doesn't get to understood that Mr. Charged. Halls did not post the safety bulletins. On it's a, misleading, on a, but on it's not improper. Correct. I understood that. I mean, he's allowed to do it. I hated the question. I hated the way he was arguing, but I get why he's doing it. Um, like, I don't like it, but it is what it is. Um, 
on That's, your camera and what you're doing with that, right? So you're not always seeing everything else around you. I'm not necessarily seeing, but I'm trying to watch and listen to everything uh, that I can on set. Let me ask you about that, listening to everything. You talked about uh, with the negligent discharge by Sarah Zachary, nothing being called out in terms of uh, a gun being operated. Do you recall that testimony? I do. Now, what channel, radio channel, were you using on set? Would you regularly use? I'm a grip, so I'm always on channel eight, sir. Channel eight. And do you, do you understand, or did you understand that the armor operates on channel one? And that's when that's called out on channel one and it goes to David Halls. Did you know that? Um, if it only goes to channel one and Dave Halls, then somebody's failed at their job because their job is to let everybody know what's going on with firearms and ammunition on set. And were you aware then, sir, before you gave your testimony to the jury that that responsibility is Mr. Halls then to call out, we're going to have a gun scene? Were you aware of that? I'm aware of what Mr. Halls' responsibilities are, certainly. Okay, well then, why didn't you say that earlier? That when this was called out, you may have been on the wrong channel. Maybe Mr. Halls didn't call it out. Did you not know that? I don't understand your question. I wasn't my, on the wrong channel. I'm on channel 8 where I'm supposed to be, sir. Okay, well then, the failure was not Ms. Gutierrez Reeds, which you wanted to imply to the jury. It was Mr. Halls, wasn't it? Um, Ms. Gutierrez Reed loaded a firearm that killed my friend and injured a director. I'm not talking about the incident. I'm talking this is also why it is dangerous to piss off a witness. This is why it's dangerous to piss off a witness. Because that was a witness who wanted to... That was a witness who wanted to punch the lawyer in the gut. And he can't do it. But he can do the next best thing. And that is to drop that answer. You know, he's trying to get him to agree that, oh, you know, it was, it wasn't was Hannah's fault. Damn, that was, that's not the answer you want. The jury was, okay, well then, the failure was not Miss Gutierrez Reeves, which you wanted to imply to the jury, it was Mr. Halls, wasn't it? Um, Ms. Gutierrez Reed loaded a firearm that killed my friend and injured a director. I'm not talking about the incident. I'm talking about the negative. The defense lawyer is trying to recover from that. The jury, if the jury is sympathetic still to this guy, we have gotten to a point where I think that, you know, there's going to be fights in the jury room. Like, not like physical fights, but there's going to be real like arguing over this because the jury who wants that you know the jury who's feeling sympathetic to this guy is just like mm. discharge with sarah zachary we're talking about that incident now first of all you have no idea who loaded that weapon the miss zachary negligently discharged do you i i wasn't there when the weapon was loaded so no Okay, and you have no idea, but you said earlier, you don't even know if there was a bullet in it. Um, I saw a bullet in Joel Souza's shoulder. I, I'm, I'm not talking. <laughs> Ouch. Um, again, this angry witness is just continuing to throw punches wherever he can, right? Um, and this is the thing. This is a lawyer who's trying to ask close-ended questions. You you know, he asked a yes-no question. You know, you didn't see, you didn't know if there's a bullet in it. And he's like, I saw a bullet in his shoulder. Whew. Um, you know, there he came to play. He came to fight. I'm talking about that. And I know you want to keep coming back to it for your lawsuit. But I'm talking about Sarah. That was fucking improper that was improper um i saw a bullet in joel souza's shoulder i I'm, I'm not talking about that i know you want to keep coming back to it for your lawsuit but i'm talking about sarah zachary's negligent Remember, discharge to, object, uh, to, to, to mr bulls's tone uh, that was gross that that was improper that should not have happened and we're going to listen to the objection again. Zachary's negligent no, discharge. To, object, uh, to, to, to Mr. Bowles' tone, uh, indicating Just, this... Please, no commentary. Yes, I won't, Your Honor. I won't. Thank you. 
So with regard, please no commentary. I think that that actually was possibly the time for the uh, for her to ask for a mistrial. Um, that I did not approve of at all. Compared to Sarah Zachary's negligent discharge, you have no idea whether it was a blank, whether it was a live round. You just don't know. Correct. Okay. Now, you talk a lot throughout your testimony about all these failures you find in Miss Gutierrez Reed, yet in your lawsuit, it's all about production of Mr. Baldwin. Can you explain that? Why you talk about production of Mr. Baldwin in your lawsuit and not Miss Gutierrez Reed? I would refer you to my counsel, sir. I don't she, write, I didn't write that lawsuit, so okay. I would refer you to my counsel for those questions. You went after the people with money for the lawsuit, right? And then I went after production, the people responsible for hiring the people that killed and shot someone on a film set. And, and you, as part of that, um, talk about that. That answer, by the way, defense is going to use that answer in their clothes. Um, the decision to hire Ms. Gutierrez Reed was motivated by production's desire to have a quick and cheap production. That was part of their because desire to hire Because defense wants to blame production and uh, not position Anna. in that role. Make her do two jobs, right? Apparently, that's what it says. That's what it says. Okay. And so the reason why I'm saying uh, on the mistrial is that um, that you like the jury's heard it and that was really improper that was really prejudicing now i mean the prosecution might be saying that the defense is convicting their client right they might be that that might be the call but um it was it shouldn't have been to the jury you indicated that this was constantly rushed and reckless and chaotic on set, correct? Correct. And you heard Mr. Baldwin a couple of times at least rushing people and tell them to move, 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 right? I did. Okay. Did you hear Mr. Halls do that also? I did. Did you ever stand up to Mr. Baldwin and say, no, we're not going to move this fast? That's not my job, sir. Okay. And did you ever see anybody else stand up to Mr. Baldwin tell him not to move that fast? I don't recall anybody standing up to Mr. Baldwin on the set of rest, sir. Defense is going to use this it? as well. Uh, Objection to the form of question calls for speculation. You, you never saw anybody. You're starting to hear the tone from, from the prosecution. Prosecution's getting mad. Prosecution is angry about how they're treating this witness. This is why the relationship between, because we've seen them be very friendly. The relationship breaks down here because the prosecution is mad about what they're doing to him. State the question. Yes, Your Honor. You, you are aware, based on your uh, seeing Mr. Baldwin, how he interacted with everybody, it was your perception nobody was going to stand up to him, wasn't it? Correct. Yeah. Because he's, he's um, well, he, he's running the show. He's the big boss, right? He's both, well, he's the producer, one of the writers, and on the call sheet, he's number one. So, yes. So, wouldn't you, wouldn't you find it difficult for a 24-year-old female armor in her, as you call it, her second movie, with everybody else, grown men, not standing up to Mr. Bell? Wouldn't you find you're that 24, difficult You're 24, you're grown. Also? I wasn't in her position. It's the, the better answer is it's now you her also job. talk about the IATSE armor. You knew that Miss um, Gutierrez Reed was not yet in the union. Actually, I my understanding was it was a union show and the crew was union. But you didn't know whether she was not union. She's not union. You didn't know that. Mr. Bowles is testifying, Your Honor. No, I'm no, asking no. if he's aware. No, no, no. But you are not. testifying. Here's the thing: you can't tell, like you can't testify as a witness, or a, you know, when you're the lawyer, and that's what he's doing there. He's, you know, he's saying you were aware she's not union. He's like, I didn't know, and it's like, she wasn't union, and he's like, you know, that's yeah. You said she's not in the union. 
Okay, that's your testimony. Well, so ask the ask it as a question rather than testifying. Yes. Were you aware that Miss Gutierrez Reed is not union? I was under the impression that we were doing a union movie. Everybody on the crew was union. I didn't learn that she was not yet in the union until after. So you did learn that after? Correct. Okay. And you know from your experience in over 100 credits and being on a movie, having the union behind you makes it, uh, makes it likely that you can stand up. I mean, in other words, if there's a safety issue and you, you have your union behind you, you can raise that because you've got the union. Um, on a union movie, any crew member has the support of a union, whether they're union or not. They are represented by IATSE. Well, could you have stopped uh, the it whole might production be. I don't know. if you wanted but to, if you saw all these safety issues? I certainly could have voiced my opinion whether or not they would have honored that and stopped anything. I cannot say. Okay, so you, you did say on the safe, the negligent discharges, you went to Mr. Halls. And this is and the you thing. Told him you he were is concerned, being a little You told him you were concerned about safety. Is that correct? That is correct. And you also told his second AD, Anne. You told both of them, right? Anne was his second second, just to be clear. But yes, second, I did second, mention second. it to Anne as well that it that I was concerned and that this needed to be on the dailies, the daily production report. Um, knowing that the other producers typically read the production reports, as would the insurance company or whoever's bonding the film. Okay, and, and you didn't see any anybody do anything after you made those complaints. Um, I wouldn't necessarily see anybody do anything because they would potentially be on channel one having that conversation. If the state loses, themselves. they can't appeal. The other producers typically read the production reports, as would the insurance company or whoever's bonding the film. Okay, and, and you didn't see any anybody do anything after you made those complaints? Um, I wouldn't necessarily see anybody do anything, because they would potentially be on channel one having that conversation amongst themselves. Well, did you see anything happen, like additional training, um, any kind of actions taken by Mr. Halls that you saw? I didn't see anything change. We're going to jump ahead a little bit here. Carts that are professional looking that can be locked up, that an armor can use to lock up those weapons on it? Yes, and I believe I described that earlier. Okay. And this cart and this set was not like that. I believe it was just kind of a, a more of what I would be accustomed to seeing craft services use, like an open, uh, gray, Emily, we're going to wrap plastic cart. We're almost done. And were you aware that it took uh, over a week? for the props department even to get that cart? There is, it's just very different. Not the props department, um, not I'm not really aware of what the they do okay. in that sense. So this cart that they had on set that they were supposed to use for their firearms it's, it, on this rust set, it wouldn't lock. It was more like something you would see in the crafts department. So it's got, so, and production provides that, right? Again, I don't know what the props department were brought or what they were provided. A lot of us rent the production companies our appropriate gear. Some of that may be carts, some of that may be tools. So he doesn't know, right? Okay, so you don't you don't know. You, no. You also don't know if the The thing is is that, that if the armor isn't being provided with sufficient tools, then she's supposed to walk, right? She's supposed to put her foot down. Firearms that you said were laying out from time to time Formless, on the yes, cart the crown can appeal in some were cases. real firearms or were plastic, were replica. You don't know that for sure. Um, I can tell you that the firearms certainly looked real as they would reflect the sunlight. They were certainly metal firearms, whether they were uh, actual fire firing guns. No, I don't know. But my experience is any firearm, even rubber dummy, at the very least in some sort of soft firearms case, a bag, somehow uh, protected and not laying on top of a cart that's well, not secured. Well, you saw the gun. So, so he's basically saying you don't know that that cart, you know, where she was keeping everything loosey-goosey was, you know, that it wasn't real. Yeah that had some sort of sock or some soft covering on them sure and the handguns had the socks too you never and saw she was those. an armor liability wise that day in any kind of container sir okay. 
Like, um, she agreed to the liability that day. And every day. Did now you we're ever gonna hear get Hannah call spicy. out the load amounts? Uh, you testified earlier you didn't, but you weren't always around those scenes when Hannah was dealing with the, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed was dealing with the firearms, were you? Um, I was on set 95% or more of the time, so there may have been an instance where she called out whatever power that plank load would have been, and I missed it. And again, if she's calling it out on channel one, and Mr. Halls is supposed to then communicate that, and you're on another channel, she may have called it out and you didn't hear it. Well, the protocols on set typically is the armorer would, would call that out verbally. Whether, what she does on her radio, I don't know. I'm not on that channel. And then the first assistant director would parrot that and let us all know and to you, make sure there was redundancy and that we heard it was hot or cold. And sir, are you, are you sitting now under oath telling this jury that Hannah never called out the loads that were used on that set. Are you going to tell them that under oath, that you never heard that? This is improper. Um, this is a tactic that you'll always see in movies. Like, are you going to tell this jury under oath? It's not appropriate. Um, the guy's under oath, right? You know, you can't usually do this sort of thing. And he's already answered the question. Um, Reed isn't actually her name. Her name is legally Hannah Gutierrez. She goes by Hannah Gutierrez Reed as like an alias because she wants to, you know, she wants to be associated with her dad. So, um, hello on this jury, hot or cold. And sir, are you, are you sitting now under oath telling this jury that Hannah never called out the loads that were used on that set. Are you going to tell them that under oath, that you never heard that? Objection, Your Honor. That has not been his testimony, and he's already answered this question. It's been asked and answered. Now, I got to say, this he deals with this well, because he's just, he wanted to, he wanted to force that, and the judge says it's been asked and answered, and he just nods and moves on. Uh, this That was a bad break for him, and he just is like, okay, moves on. So other than reporting to Mr. Halls and, and the second, did you ever report this to anybody else if you were so concerned about it? Did you report it to Gabrielle Pickle? Did you report it to anybody else? Did you report it to Joel Souza? Um, I can't get I over the, that Joel Souza and Helena before she was killed had a conversation about some of the safety issues. That was my payroll question. issues. And I did notify might, local lady, which was the union that represented me while I was making that movie. When did you notify local lady? You'd have to contact local lady. It was early in the movie and I can't give you a definitive date, sir. Well, no, I'm asking you, I'm not going to contact local lady. They're not here in court. He's, he's already yeah. indicated he doesn't remember. Judge, I can't, can I do my cross-examination? Well, sure. If you do it properly, you can. Uh, I'm doing it properly. Listen, listen, listen. Okay, let's watch this again, because this is some fireworks. He's, he's already indicated he doesn't remember. Judge, I can't. We're going to go a little further back. When, which was the union that represented me while I was making that movie. When did you notify local lady? You'd have to contact local lady. It was early in the movie, and I can't give you a definitive date, sir. Well, no, I'm asking so he's just you. said, said he doesn't remember, right? Local lady. They're not here in court. He's, he's already yeah. indicated he doesn't remember. Judge, I can't, can I do my cross-examination? Well, sure. If you do it properly, you can. Uh, I'm doing it properly. Listen, listen, listen. Yeah. Now they're getting into a fight, and the judge is like, kids, come on. You can't do this. The judge is like, children, come on. Like, oh. Uh, Thing is, prosecution is right in this, you know, the prosecution is correct here. The witness has indicated he doesn't remember, and so you don't get to, you know, you don't get to just keep hounding him. Ask the question about the date. He said he didn't remember, and then you started to 
tell him you weren't going to ask that person and that he was going to tell you in so many words, okay? Yes. So let's not be argumentative. Let's yes. just ask him. You can ask him one more time. So do you have any idea what date you may have contacted Local 80? I believe it was in the first week of production. Okay. So the first week of production was before any, any um, accidental discharges would have happened. That doesn't mean I wasn't concerned about safety. And I understand, and my, my question was not that. I understand you were concerned. My question was, that was before any of the accidental discharges. Um, I don't recall exactly if that was before or after, but once I contact Local 80, that doesn't mean I stopped talking to Local 80 throughout production. So I think we had more than one uh, conversation about it. So... She gets, or he gets handed a sticky note. The sticky note might be, I think it might say something like, you're losing the jury. Um, you're losing the jury, I think is what's there. Like, move on. Stop getting into stupid fights. Keep moving. It's because it's because a completely you're different person. Because Local 80, did they do anything about it? Um, my understanding was they contacted the New Mexico local, which is 480, and a representative from 480 showed up, and a, possibly a representative from the camera union local 600. Also I wander up. all over a drinks menu. What happened at that point? Did, did they do anything? Um, they have conversations that I'm not part of, right. sir. Yeah. Ultimately, the camera crew was disgruntled, and they walked off the day before the shooting. Part of that was their hotel situation. You were aware of that, weren't you? Uh, that was also testifying. I don't know about disgruntled, but I know that they were promised hotels or housing, and, and those promises never came to fruition. Okay. And so they left, and, and the next day when they, uh, you, there had to be a new camera crew, um, they had to get some more people. You, you were aware video, video Village was down? You see how he's now dropped that really hostile tone? He's moving on to more, you know, questioning kind of things. I'm pretty sure he got given a note saying, knock it off. Um, I was not. You didn't know Video Village was down at all? Asked and answered, Your Honor. Council approach. Council approach, which is just chill the F out. <laughs> she is mad. She's really angry. Um, she's really angry about how this witness has been treated. She's coming in. She is pissed. She's really pissed. And this is a good time to remind you to do all of the YouTube things. Whoops. I missed the... Uh, so please like the stream, share it, you know, all of those things. Subscribe if you haven't, because um, it really does help. So... Yeah, I mean, you look at the judge's face. She is tired of this shit, and she is... Look at where her eyes are. She's on bulls. She's like, you've got to, like, knock it off. you gotta, you got to stop it. Um, but she also wants the prosecution to be like, chill the F out. Um, do I think Bullion's not there as he was the one watching Court TV on Friday? He was the one watching Court TV, as far as I can tell. I don't know that that's the reason why he got bounced um so um so and somebody noting that they got unsub they they it happens every once in a while um she whew. yeah bullion is in the room he wasn't allowed to be removed as uh, as a lawyer uh, but he's he's been sidelined. Um, he's been sidelined. Yeah, it was the prosecutor watching uh, Court TV. Uh, Court TV can watch it. They just can't let, you know, yeah. Uh, Marbled Cat, yes, I did see his finger on the trigger. He's going to be, uh, 
He's going to be crossed on that when he goes to trial. Ooh. Yeah, it's Timu Rob who's been sidelined. He's not out, but he's sidelined. He's not allowed to talk to Hannah. He's um, he's not going to do much else. Um, nuclear beans. <laughs> The reason why the attorneys would get in trouble for watching it is that they had sound on. You. Um, it depends so on if the jury is Baldwin with him. Baldwin always wanted to use his hero props, or words to that effect. Do you recall that? Yes. And by that, you meant he wanted to use the real, for example, the real revolver? That was my understanding of his, his uh, the way he liked to perform, yes, sir. Okay. And, and would that also include, sir, the, like the knife, those kind of... Beans pickled with uh, Carolina Reapers. Um, my recollection is Mr. Baldwin always wanted to be uh ready to call rolling when he was ready so hero props uh in his wardrobe mm -hmm. essentially ready to go okay. and every this i think is the approach that he should have taken at the beginning because this guy hates everybody on set he hates everybody and they started off throwing shit directly at this guy like directly at the witness. I think that what they should have done, what the better approach would have been, is to get the guy started on how much he hates Baldwin and how much he hates Sarah Zachary and how much he hates all of those people. And then they could have, um, you know, then they could have gone after him as well. But they could start off just pointing him at, um, you know, all of the other people. Everybody else had to be ready to go when, when he was ready. Yes. Okay. Um, Hannah's still there. Yeah, this witness would have gone after Baldwin, no problem. So that, sir, it was your understanding, and I, uh, you may have said this, and I just want to go back over it, but that Mr. Baldwin did not that scene or that rehearsal did not require the the draw was that your understanding um, my understanding was it was really just the initiation of that movement mm -hmm. was the part of the story that joel Souza wanted to tell okay and that i think he called it an extreme close-up shot of his hand Correct. coming out okay this so it would is be coming out this... of his holster and there would be an extreme close-up on that uh, correct. The frame would have been essentially his right hand going into his coat to draw his firearm. Okay, sir. You do this before you piss him off, not after. Do this first. Do this first. Okay, Your Honor, may I have just a moment? Yeah. All right, we're going to jump a little to redirect. Oh. Yeah. If he, if, if he knows based, up, based upon his personal knowledge. In your opinion, working on this movie set with Ms. Gutierrez and working on other movie sets with other armors, if she had taken the dummies, rattled them, showed them to the cast and crew... Objectionable. Do you think that live round would have been discovered? No. You don't? And well, he answers the wrong had thing. Had we looked at <laughs> all of the ammo, we would have known whether it was dummies or live. Who made the decision? That is the sort of thing a jury might put way too much weight on. Why does he answer no? He answers no because he's hearing the wrong question. He's hearing in his head, would Helena Hutchins have died? But the jury is going to, the jury is going to like remember this moment. You know they will. Not to show the cast and crew the dummy rounds. Prior to Sorry, it was the prosecutor who was watching. Anyone it. in the church? It was the prosecutor? I would guess the armor, or. Again, he's just guessing. He, he, he is. Said he would guess. All right, all right, that's his answer. He guessed, so we'll strike it. We'll strike it. It's out. He guessed. Is it your understanding that Ms. Gutierrez loaded that gun? 
It, it is. Sorry, did you all hear me because my mic was off? Yes, you're all saying yes. Okay. In your opinion, would Ms. Hutchins be alive today if Ms. Gutierrez had not put a live round in the gun? Janet, I'm going to check. I'm going to strike that. It struck, but the jury's heard it anyway. <laughs> like, the jury heard that question. And the jury is going to be answering that question right. for themselves, right? Apparently, defense is, counseling, is calling Jensen Ackles. I don't know why. Um, who is the person on the set of a movie who is in charge of firearms? That's the answer. Sustained. She's just flailing to try to... Do you to... know why your civil lawsuit doesn't include Ms. Gutierrez? You'd have to refer to my counsel for that answer. I don't know. She's flailing to try to get something here, and it's it's bad. Um, I often don't redirect um, unless there's a reason to redirect. She's trying to get something better out of this witness, and... Ugh. Have you testified today in order to further your civil lawsuit? Um, I've testified today to bring justice for the death of my friend. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Nothing further. All right, you're excused. Thank you, sir. She was trying to get something for, like, something to wrap it up, and I think she made the right call when she got that answer to just be like, done! I, I got something. I got something. Now, we're going to watch this witness. Um, we're going to watch him leave. All right, we're going to break for the for the evening. Uh, follow the bailiff directions. Please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Don't read anything about... That witness is mad. That witness is angry um that witness is fucking furious yeah production this case don't look anything up don't do any research thank you um where were you gonna all right we're gonna wrap that up here i'm going to put myself embiggened so, um, that was, that was rough. And yeah, KVB Studios, um, that cart should never have been in use for firearms of everything. That cart just enrages me for its very existence. I'm going to go through Super Chat. Some of them I pulled up on the screen, but, um, oh, yeah, that, that was, um, that was infuriating. So Creek says it's definitely worth 10. Can't wait to hear what you've got to say about today. I was going to be like, I'm going to do a shorter. Um, I thought this was going to be a shorter thing. Um, I wanted it to be a shorter thing. And you know what I'm getting as criticism here? Ian skipped over too much. I've been at this for nearly five hours, folks. And I'm told I've skipped over too much. Today was a big day. Um, today was a big day. Um, I was trying to be like, I'm going to keep my summaries to under two hours, but today was fucking explosive. Um, and that's why I was trying to, I was trying to hit the sweet spot to sort of sum it up here. Um, but I don't know whether you think defense did great today or absolutely bombed themselves is kind of the litmus point of this trial so far. So, um, Callista says, are we bidding? I'll race 20. Thank you so much, Callista. Much appreciated. Katie Q, thank you for the super sticker. Uh, Marsha Bishop, thank you for the new membership. Much appreciated. Uh, Marvin CZ, I'll watch most on replay, but I'm glad that I can watch at least the beginning live. Me too. Uh, Caitlin Moore says, Pew expert. I got only FBI could find the fake. Um, that's kind of what the argument was there. Tess, thank you for the uh, $10 super chat there. 
CLO says, I think you should uh, physically go to uh, the Baldwin trial. I'm thinking about it. I mean, if I go physically, then I can't, um, then I can't live stream during it, right? So it's tough. I'll I have to decide that. Um, I got to decide, um, decide on all of that. So, um, yeah. Uh, question: Is Alex trial criminal or civil? He's facing both. He's got criminal trials and civil trials. Mama Betts sending love because Rob told me to and love. Thank you so much, Mama Betts, and thank you as well to Rob. Uh, Rob had a busy day today. He's got all sorts of chaos. Uh, Silky Mom says, I'll mainly be I'll be mainly watching replay, but needed the tea. Thank you so much. Nara Dox says, their argument hasn't been she's inexperienced. They said uh, he's been on sets or uh, she's been on sets since little. They're saying she's young, couldn't stand up to production. Yeah, and that is, I mean, her job is to stand up to people who want to cut corners. Her job is to be the person who says, don't cut the corners. Um, so, uh, excuse me, he says pigeon business. I tell you, I didn't roll the pigeon business bumper today because Apple Silver's in the chat and got absolutely ripped to shit because of, um, uh, by his cat the last time. Uh, but Billy's Momzilla, thank you for the five gifted memberships. Much appreciated. Camellia R, thank you for the new membership. Much appreciated. Shy town Native, oh my god, yes, go. Your input on jury reactions is truthfully wonderful, and we'd love to have law nerds represented. That's the thing, is I kind of want to see the jury. Um, so, Canonical Heat, thank you for the 20 gifted memberships. Much appreciated. Um, Rob Smith, why would anyone force an attorney to work for them? Is that would provide shitty service. I'd not do that for my truck mechanic. I want my truck to work. That's a good argument. Uh, Shiraz, thank you so much for the gifted memberships. 20 gifted memberships. Much appreciated. Uh, Vez from Quebec, I'm here for the pigeon business. We had some pigeon business for sure. Um, canonical heat. Um, that requires me to find this. Those adorable notification bell, like, and subscribe buttons await you. Thanks, Ruckle, for this coverage. Thank you so much, Canonical Heat. I really appreciate it. Uh, Nick Starro, Bryce Ziegler, the dork brother of pro wrestler Dolph Ziegler. Um, maybe. <laughs> Happy Hippie, welcome. Uh, thank you for the membership. Same with Toadette. And Midnight Dreary, thank you for the gifted membership. And Lori Lenny, thank you for five gifted memberships. Much appreciated. Happy Hippie, thank you so much for the super sticker. Um, all of this helps keep, keep me going because um, it's a lot of work on these things to do like you know, because I got to watch the whole trial and take notes and then I got to, um, and then, you know, I got to prep and then we're running. So thank you so much. Uh, Professor of Logic, 2.5 pounds is not light for a single action. It's banking on you not cocking a weapon if not ready to fire. Yep. Um, it's normal for a single action. Aislinn R, uh, thank you for the super chat here. It can be used as well as a pre-run of the evidence before the next trial, somewhat like a prelim. Yep, they're both um, Baldwin and the prosecution are going to be taking note of whether or not they should, um, what like what things they need to do for the um, for Baldwin's trial. So absolutely, um, uh, R. Louise, you're the best, Ruckel. Thank you so much. Uh, Ryan Man, uh, or Rain Man YYC, I keep saying Ryan, it's Rain Man YYC, thank you for the gifted memberships, I hope you're doing well, man. Um, Baby Johnny uh, Frost Robertson, thank you so much for the super sticker. Uh, Lani, thank you for the membership, much appreciated. Uh, Mysterica, isn't this all foundational for the evidence, kind of? Uh, Vez from Quebec, are we getting Daily Runkle this week? Woohoo, yes, and there's a couple of other things I need to squeeze in there, so... Daily Runkle Plus. Uh, Marsha Bishop, thank you for the YouTube membership. Much appreciated. Daffy9, love me some Runkle. Thanks. Thank you. Um, James C, I run drop tests on computer components. Fun stuff. Um, I don't think there's a lot of computers that I think you could drop, so awesome. Um, <laughs> that's that's impressive. Um, uh, Brian, uh, Brian Alleman, I ran a drop test on my kid. He's fine, I hope. Jamie Fedor, thank you for the membership. Much appreciated. Susan Faria, did my course and did well, but somehow made me even more nervous about it. Ranges aren't new to me, but without a license, I had a professional focus on my hands and keep me focused. Inputs, please, with my license on the way. 
keep that fear. Keep being nervous. Uh, practice for it. And, um, you know, just keep... I assume you mean your firearms license. Keep being careful. Don't get to that point where you are cutting corners because that's where... In, you know, that's when people get dangerous. Is that point where they start feeling comfortable and they feel it's okay to start being risky. So, um, uh, she didn't say you were the best. She said you are the best runkle. Oh, fair enough. I guess I might be the best runkle. So, um, sorry uh, for, but I really trust your knowledge. No worries. I, uh, so professor of logic, he's thinking the gun weighs enough to exceed 2.5 pounds when dropped, not realizing that it's not 2.5 pounds smacking the hammer forward. Yeah. Um, that's not how that works. Nick Starro, Amy Farrah Fowler. Maybe. I'm not sure. Uh, Ash Axiom. Thank you for the gifted membership. Much appreciated. Uh, Zafla Beats One. Thank you so much for the super chat there. Lady Draconis for the Baldwin coverage, uh, Baldwin coverage fund. Thank you so much. Um, Jeff LaBeats uh, says, Judge's ruled attorney must tell us testify in Willis' case. Ooh, that case got spicy. I'm going to stick with Rust, but I'm curious. I'm going to have to follow up on that later. Special KL, come on, chat. Help me in. You have an award-winning expert on firearms recapping a trial. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, JJ with the dog, normally a lurker, but here's a cup of coffee for all your work. Thanks for the pigeon business work merch, too. I got to get myself some Pigeon Business merch. Axiom, thank you so much for another gifted membership. Special KL, thank you for five gifted memberships. Holly, thank you uh, for the membership there. Uh, Professor of Logic, she was fine with him as long as he looked like Rob, but she watched Home Improvement reruns last night and realized he's Al Borland. <laughs> That's the reason why um, <laughs> why he's out, I guess. So, yeah. Um so, Nanner, for a startle bottle of headache medicine you're going to need for this trial, spicy time. A little bit. Special KL, thank you for the super sticker. Much appreciated. Uh, Caitlin Fletcher, catching up now, but wanted to say hi and look forward to these recaps. They're going to keep going. Um, we're going to, I'm going to keep at it. Against the Tide, make sure to like and share to support Ian's goals to work pro bono. Also, check out his Roll of Law channel. Thank you so much, Against the Tide. Uh, Laura Mott, chat going fast because of Orange Jumpsuit. And the see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil uh, monkeys there. Dirk Schwartz, if the defense continued the argument, Gutierrez couldn't have told the difference. When would be the best time for the prosecution to debunk it the way you did? If you can't tell the difference, don't load it. Armor. They got to call an armor. That's, and that's what the armor has got to, they got to get that through the armor. Laurie Lenny, half of you forgot to like and sub. It's free. It's true. Um, Petty honest throwaway. So what Runkle is saying, wear nothing to court. No. You you gotta wear clothes. You gotta wear you gotta wear clothes. That's important. So um, yeah, um, I see. Uh, I said this in chat earlier, but I really want to see if you hear it too. When the defense said, "Can I do my cross?" I swear he says, "Can I do my cross?" Shit, is it just me? I didn't I didn't hear the shit. So um, I didn't hear that. Um, Alicia G, thanks for all your work on recaps. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor of Logic, it's hard to keep a camera still. Just ask 90s MTV programming. Nice. <laughs> nice. Uh, Professor of Logic, that's why I only drive crazy in my Yugo and very cautiously in my Bugatti. Fair enough. Southern Bomb, thanks for your ever excellent coverage. Do you think the prosecution should have just brought up his lawsuit to get it out of the way? I do. Um, I think they should have tackled that. I think that was a mistake on the prosecution's part. Professor of Logic, I would imagine being convicted of a felony would make uh, will make handling firearms professionally a breeze. Yeah, um, I actually think like I think that the prosecution could have gotten out. Why you know you're so you're suing Alec Baldwin? Why are you suing Alec Baldwin? Like all of this, it makes it so much better than that. Um, Lisa H asking, did Rob buy the house? That is for Rob to announce. You know, so yeah. Uh, Lenova, I hope I'm getting that right. Thank you so much for the YouTube membership there. I saw you in chat. I loved your comment there. Um, there's no more testimony for today. So Shannon MC, thank you for the YouTube membership. We're just going through super chats and sort of wrapping up. John Coman comes now productions presents the quarter load. Oh God. Um, oh God. Cachette chat union requests an updated pin comment. Thank you. I did. I didn't put a new pin comment, but I removed the old one. 
Uh, Farin, thank you so much for the YouTube membership. Much appreciated. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Just because I have to go to bed, but the union had to do a lot more when they noticed safety regulations weren't going right. They had to walk out earlier. Union did kind of drop the ball on this one. And just because, says, and yet he thought everything was on the up and up on a union set and it was a union armor I call BS. Fair. Uh, Ari Jacobs says, thanks for having me, Runkle. If anyone wants to see the little film made about my case versus Lorenz later, it's pinned to my ex, Little Miss Jacob. Sorry for interrupting the stream, guys. Well, thank you for coming on, uh, Ari. It was much appreciated. Christine D, do subpoenas override NDAs? Yes, you cannot, like, prevent somebody from testifying. Tom Horton, fair point about not trusting actors as an armor. To quote Charles F. Uh, Oftenson, that's my bread and butter you're fucking with. Fair enough. Yellow Pill NP, comes now Productions presents Whip Out and Fully Cock the Hero Props. <laughs> Lenova, thank you so much for going over this trial footage and talking through it with us. Thank you for joining me. It's a lot of fun. Peyton Waysmiller, I love these streams, Ian. They make my day. Thank you so much. Against the Tide for a protein bar to keep at your desk. I actually do have a box of Cliff Bars there. I sh forgot about it. I have questions. Thank you for the 10 gifted memberships. Much appreciated. Midnight Dreary, thank you for the gifted membership. I'm going to make myself some more, um, some more bitter melon after this. So, um... Oh, and I see it's Farron. Okay, Farron. I'll uh, I'll try to get that right. Thank you. Thank you for the correction. So, Marbled Cat, by the way, did you see Baldwin's finger on the trigger in the video clip when he pulled the gun out? I imagine that'll hurt him in his case. It will, uh, because people will say, hey, you had your finger on the trigger every time you draw, drew it in this. What do you mean you didn't have your finger on the trigger? You know, yeah. Magda, thank you so much for the YouTube membership. Much appreciated. Uh, Mama Mea, uh or Mama Mimi. Uh, thank you so much for the super sticker. It's got a symbol that isn't parsing. Uh, Yellow Pill. Uh, she whips her glasses off her face more often than an anime antagonist monologuing about their tragic backstory. It is getting to be a bit of a distracting affectation. So, yeah. Uh, B1 Laxon. If you rewatch the Alec with the gun footage, watch both Trigger Finger uh, and moving from back to side in the air of the hammer. A few of us spotted it. Yeah, I... I think he pulls back the uh, the hammer there. So, yeah. Uh, Cookie Lady 9995 you did a great job on the recap, Ian. Thank you so much. Uh, Darth Sarah, do both. Head there for the jury. Stream alter alternating days. Uh, tempting. I'll have to think. Kefaz, great live. Hope you can go to Alec Baldwin's trial. I, I'm really tempting. So, Amanda Lang, stream live. See if Rob will, will jury watch for you. Um... Uh, I, I think Rob's got too much of a <laughs> life or too much of a job and life and all of that. Um, he's got, you know, mischief to take care of too. Emma Zay, your takes here are priceless. Uh, when I have a bit more time, I'll speed watch EDB's vids for bits missed, but not sure if I can tolerate the fuckery again. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> Michelle, can't wait for a local meetup. You are doing great. Where are you, Michelle? Um, so... Melanie uh, Schuler, uh, awesome coverage. Thank you so much. Lenova, thank you so much for the late night live. Appreciate it. Thank you for joining me. I really do appreciate it. James C., I've had my legal investigator certificate for a year. I need work. Let me know if you need an investigator. Um, whereabouts are you located? And are you, well, if you're located in my area, we'll talk. So um, we'll talk because I have some, uh, you know, I got some thoughts on things. So, um, I got some thoughts. So, um, whoever first commented comes now productions. You're my new favorite person. Uh, maybe I should actually like try to trademark that. Um, cameras, but Edmonton will do. I, I will set one up. Um, I'll set one up. So it'll have to be after the rust trial though, but I will set one up. So, yeah. All right. So thank you guys all for joining me. I am going to go to sleep because I have to be up in not too... I, okay, no. I said I'm going to go to sleep. I have videos to record. I have a... Um, I've got videos to record. I've got a... Um, uh, I've got a piece of legislation to read. I've got food I've got to cook. Um, so I'm going to get to sleep at like 2... Uh, sleep until like, you know, five hours of sleep. That's, that's enough sleep for people, right? People don't need more than five hours of sleep. 
Um, watch the video, like watch this and, um, oh yes, I have Janet's to mock. I have Jan. I got to I might do that during the lunch break tomorrow of record a video mocking the Janet. Cause there's a, I got to read the Janet decisions and mock that. Okay. Um, all right, let's, um, let's roll the outro and I will see you guys tomorrow. Mm -hmm.